Good morning. This public meeting of the Investment Committee is being held at 30 North 3rd Street, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. By participating in this session, you are consenting to the recording, retention, and future viewing of this meeting. Although being live streamed via the internet, this meeting is an a live in-person meeting open to the public in accordance with the Sunshine Act. The live streaming of this meeting is presented as a convenience, is not provided as an official means for public attendance. In the event the live stream fails or cannot be transmitted for any reason, the in-person public meeting will continue without interruption. Please proceed. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Don. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to call to order. Uh, this September 22, 2022 meeting of the Investment Committee of the Pennsylvania State Employees Retirement System. Uh, I am Glenn Becker, and I serve as chair of the Investment Committee. Uh, may we have a roll call, please, uh, Bill Tron? Yes. Uh, chair Becker. Present. Senator DeSanto. Mr. Erdman. Right, okay. Mr. Philman. Present. Representative Frankel. Dan Opko, designee. Thank you. Treasurer Garrity. I'm here. Senator Hughes. Matt Lindsay on behalf of Senator Hughes. Thank you. Mr. Jordan. Here. Representative Schemmel. Here. Ms. Soderberg. Here. Secretary Thal. Here. Secretary Vig. Alan Flanagan on Secretary Vig's behalf. Thank you. All present. Great. Thank you, Bill. Uh, the first order of business today is the approval of the minutes of the July 18 2022 investment committee meeting i move that the minutes be approved as written uh, may we have a second please second thank you uh, all in favor aye. aye 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 opposed no hearing none uh, the minutes are approved as written uh, we have no old business to review today uh, but we do have quite a bit, uh, a nice agenda for new business. We have several items to cover. Uh, we will have uh, quarterly performance updates on all of the uh, public market uh, portfolios as well as the private uh, market portfolios. We have two uh, new business opportunities to consider, uh, one uh, private equity opportunity and another uh, real estate opportunity. Uh, we also have the asset liability study and uh, also the uh, an educational system, fixed uh, educational session uh, for fixed income. So with that, uh, we have a lot to cover. And I ask, uh, would ask that everybody and everyone be mindful of our time. And with that, I would like to turn it over to our CIO, Jim Nolan, and the investment office team. Thanks, Mr. Becker. Uh, just as an introduction here, uh, we normally cover any rebalancing that uh, took place uh, oh, since the last meeting, and there, interestingly, hasn't been any need for rebalancing. Private market distributions, despite the public market volatility, continue to come in ahead of calls, capital calls, and benefit payments, so we're in sufficient cash position to meet all cash needs, including benefit payments for the system. That's good. Uh, and then the market environment here, we're obviously dealing with a few, uh, three, three prongs, uh, the geopolitical risk here with the Russian uh, situation, which is just uh, apparent, just getting worse as opposed to better, unfortunately, with the news we got yesterday and today. Uh, that's impacting our global inflation. Um, obviously, the pandemic came. Stimulus was provided from both the fiscal monetary authorities. That's that's showing up in a form of uh, significant inflation that hasn't been seen in a long time. Interest rates continue to rise with the Fed's uh, committee, and that's uh, certainly uh, wreaking havoc on our public markets portfolio. Uh, the, pub, the private markets portfolio, I'm happy to report, uh, hanging in uh, a little bit better, um, but they'll catch up over time. We'll, we'll see how much. Uh, and then the consumer, two-thirds of the GDP is consumer. 
uh, driven the consumers facing higher prices, obviously, with food and gas and the like. So the investment office is monitoring all this and working with our investment managers to uh, uh, do anything, anything and everything that we can to minimize risk in this uh, volatile environment. Uh, so that's just the background on what we're looking at. Uh, like Mr. Becker said, we do have a pretty full agenda, so we want to move along quickly. Uh, in board docs item 5B, you'll see the three public market performance reports. Uh, that will be covered by uh, Tom Shingler, Bud Pelekia, and Britt Murdoch. They'll be covering those three plans, our DB, DCP, uh, and the, DC, the, the 401 plan. So that performance is going to start here. Before we do it, I just want to point out, if you look at the under 5B, the defined benefit plan report from Callen, if I direct you to page 11, just want to point out the uh, progress that we have been making uh, recently over the last few years. Uh, you can see on that page 11, Tom, Tom will cover it in detail, uh, Tom Shingler, but uh, just want to point out that for the quarter last three and five years, the uh, portfolio has exceeded its benchmark and a 60-40 portfolio. That's good news. Uh, it's also been above median in most of those periods, hold for the most recent quarter. We're pretty heavily invested in public equity, and that's uh, taken a toll. But unusual in this case where fixed income is also uh, moving in the same direct direction as equity. We typically rely on that to move in the opposite direction, or at least not as much. But because of the rising interest rates, that's a headwind for fixed income instruments. So we have this unfortunate circumstance uh, of rising interest rates as a headwind for our capital preservation bond bucket, uh, plus the equity volatility that we're experiencing. Uh, so that, that's good. We're, we're still making good progress here. We'll wait for this economic environment to hopefully improve, inflation to cool off at some point here, and the Fed be able to stop raising rates and whatever. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we'll ask Tom Shingler from Callen if he could go through our uh, quarterly performance reports. Tom? Okay. Good morning, everybody. If we could go to the DB plan executive summary, please. Thank you. And can you go to page three? <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to cover the markets briefly and the portfolio. And we also will be discussing this further when we go through the asset liability study because what's happened in market so far this year, there are implications for our forward-looking capital markets expectations broadly and specifically for the service portfolio. It's been a very challenging period in markets. We've seen a bear market in equities and the growth parts of the market being hit hardest and also in bonds. So this period for the first half of this year has been the worst period for the aggregate bond index in its history, at down over 10% year to date through the end of June. So this is a period where we've seen much higher inflation after being in a decade of inflation. We were in a much higher inflation environment today. And in response, the Fed, as Jim said, has been raising interest rates. So to give you a reference point, the 10-year Treasury was at 1.52%. At the beginning of this year and this morning it was at 3.59 percent so we've seen a very large spike in interest rates and this does have a silver lining in that our forward looking at things for fixed income with higher yields are better so we've been in a period where the cost of diversification of owning bonds has been expensive you have not gotten high yields from bonds but the bond yields are now higher, and that is good for long-term investors moving forward. So this is a very short period of time. We look at the year to date, but it's definitely been a very difficult time for markets. The equity markets, as I said, bear market, worst first half in the history of the high 
high grade or investment grade bond index. And there really hasn't been many places to hide. So one area that continues to sustain strong returns is real estate, particularly core real estate. We show the Nacreef property index. That's a property level index for real estate and the returns there continue to be very strong. We do expect those to cool in the second half of the year, but they have provided diversification for the SERS portfolio. The other area that's provided diversification is private equity. I will note that from a private equity perspective, those valuations are lagged. What you see here goes through March. There are open questions about what the reflection will be in private markets of what's happened in public markets. Will we see significant markdowns in private markets portfolio that correspond to public markets portfolio? That's an open question that a number of our clients are asking and we'll see over time. The other area that's provided diversification is commodities. So you can see commodity returns strongly positive year to date. I will note, however, that commodity returns long term are very low and it's a very volatile asset class. So maintaining a dedicated commodities allocation has proven very difficult for institutional investors. Next page, please. This is a chart that we like to show to reinforce the importance of diversification. So asset classes come in and out of favor. You can't just own one asset class in a diversified portfolio. You need to have a broad set of exposures. This year though, as I said, it's been a time when there's been a few places to hide, certainly in public markets and private markets, you can see real estate funds there. They've been the, the best performer. But overall, it is a good reminder of the importance of diversification. If we can move to slide six, please. So this is showing the total fund actual asset, asset allocation versus the target as of June 30th. We will be going through the asset allocation and the asset liability study. Jay Kleffer and Kevin Matches will be going through that later this morning. It is important to keep in mind this is not the new target that was adopted by the board earlier this year. This reflects uh, the target before that, and that will be changed as of July 1. So if you look at things like the overweight to private equity, for instance, that's not reflecting the new target of 16%. There's also been changes to the fixed income exposure that I'll go through in a moment. So if we go to the next slide, please. So this is showing the return seeking and capital preservation assets. And this is a, an important way to look at the portfolio in terms of the different parts of the portfolio and the objectives that they serve. This is showing the, the allocations and the targets go, going into 630. And as of 7-1, it does change to a 75-25 return seeking and capital preservation set of buckets. So the, the capital preservation being core fixed income, dedicated treasuries, tips, and cash. And we are comfortable with that overall risk posture. We'll talk about about that more in the asset liability study. And again, it's important to keep in mind that while we have been in this period of negative returns for bonds, if we think about long-term investors investing today at higher yields, there are, uh, there are positives. There is a silver lining to that. If we go to slide 10, I'm going to cover the attribution. So on slide 10, we're showing the quarter performance. the portfolio. This was a very difficult quarter if you think about how poor returns were for for both stocks and bonds. The, the portfolio did outperform its target, so there was positive performance on a relative basis. But overall this was a this was a, a negative quarter. So what, what did help was the outperformance from managers and private credit the U.S. equity portfolio and an international developed equity, and also having the overweight to private equity and real estate. Those did, those did provide a, a boost to performance. If we look at the one year, so quarter is a very short period of time. If we look at the one year, it was a negative return for the fiscal year. So negative 4.44% gross. We have the, the net returns. This is for the attribution that we do versus the target we're in turn of negative 5.73. So there was outperformance relative to the target. 
and what drove that, it was for the one year private credit, fixed income and international developed equity managers did provide positive relative performance. The overweight to private equity did also help relative to performance and underweight to uh, the public equity areas that did poorly. So this may look like a poor return, which it is on an absolute basis, one year to have an, a negative return. But keep in mind how poor the public market's returns were in this period. So we use a public market 60-40 reference benchmark, and the return for that for the one-year period was negative 13.9%. So having this diversification in other asset classes did help relative performance compared to just owning the 60-40 uh, broad public markets exposure. I'm going to stop there because we do have the two other reports to cover and a number of other agenda items. One note I will make on the, the report for the defined benefit plan that's in the administrative content section on board docs is that we did add pages that specifically address the diverse women disabled owned managers, the exposure that SERS has in the public markets. So there are three managers in public equity and one manager in fixed income that are diverse women or disabled owned or otherwise known as MWBE managers. So the exposure is listed in that report. Uh, we are putting that in as a, it's in the report elsewhere, but having a specific section to show that exposure. So I'll stop there and see if there's any questions before I turn it over to Britt to go through the 401A and the DCP. <clears throat> Okay. Sure, thank sure, Patrick. Uh, oh, question. go ahead, please. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, very helpful and informative as usual. Um, and, you know, while the headline return, you know, obviously is, is down, I think you gave us a lot of reason to be optimistic that our diversification is working well. Um, and would ask, you know, we're in a period with pretty high inflation, you know, yet our inflation protection assets, you know, didn't perform, you know, tremendously well on an absolute basis. Um, you know, have, you know, a personal point of view in terms of whether, uh, you know, other things like commodities and gold have a place in the portfolio. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that you don't get, you know, significant long-term rates of return on those assets as a buy and hold type thing. So, you know, is there something that we should be thinking about to, um, you know, address the inflation risk in our portfolio and, and, you know, how would you kind of assess us in terms of where we're positioned to be able to, to manage that? Thanks. Sure. I, so the, if we think about it from a public markets component, there are longer term inflation hedging components of equities to the extent that public companies can pass through their costs and maintain profit margins. That's a huge topic of debate today, whether or not that's that's going to be possible. In terms of the bond market, the TIPS portfolio did outperform the, the broad fixed income market. So it was negative, but not as negative. Now, why is that? You could say, well, there's embedded inflation protection there. I'd say it's disappointing on the one hand, the other aspect to it is that TIPS do have a duration component to them, and in that rising interest rate environment, that's what detracted. So you've got some relative benefit in fixed income, but I would say uh, the, the the level of rising yields did consume some of that uh, that positive benefit. Real estate has continued to offer that inflation hedging and diversification. I think as we move forward, we can look at, do we, do we want to expand the level of inflation protection? That, I think those are, those are good questions to spend more time on. The Fed is very focused on bringing down inflation. How quickly they can do that is an open question. They used to talk about transitory. They no longer do because uh, inflation's endured. They're very focused on it. Uh, Chair Powell made that really clear in Jackson Hole and they continue to, to do it, they just raise rates another 75 basis points, but that's that can only do so much to bring down inflation. So I do think it that it does require more uh, continued review. 
the other aspect to it is you mentioned gold and commodities. I think that all these components have to be looked at. Uh, as I said on commodities, that's one that it, it's proved very difficult to withstand because it's such a volatile asset class. Uh, it doesn't have a positive real return in our view. It, it, it's, uh, it does have an inflation hedging component, but you should not expect a risk premium from commodities or gold for that matter. So uh, every aspect of it will, is on the table, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily say those are the, the best ways to it to achieve uh, inflation protection. Oh, we, we very much agree with that view on golden commodities. Uh, appreciate <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah, and, and just to add to what Tom's saying, I just want to remind the board, there was a recommendation a couple of years ago to eliminate the inflation hedging bucket in its entirety and terminate all the TIPS exposure. Uh, and it was uh, Tom and his team that came to the rescue and said, you can't fight inflation after it's already known. You've got to have protection beforehand. and. It's, it's good we at least did that. Uh, we, we maintained that component. And like Tom said, our real estate portfolio, which has been a little bit of a struggle over the years, as we know, but it's certainly shining this year with positive returns in an environment where there's not much positive, uh, as I said, in equities or fixed income. So, Tom, thanks for that. Uh, and Glenn Becker, too, he was uh, adamant about that uh, tips asset class with his fixed income background expertise he, he's well aware of that risk that it's uh, present uh, and you got to be protecting ahead of time uh, now we'll move back to the two other plans uh, the deferred comp plan is in a, over four billion dollars now in assets uh, just want to remind the, the board uh, we don't talk a lot about it uh, Callen, the Callen team had made uh, reference to this in a, uh, recently that we might want to take a little bit more time talk about the stable value program in the future. So we'll be doing that just for your uh, information, as you see in the executive report that uh, Bud and Brett are going to be covering here. The deferred comp plan does have a stable value fund, which is a uh, uh, has insurance wrappers around a fixed income program. Uh, it's a fairly complicated structure, but we have that uh, outsourced to Invesco and Callum carefully monitors that as well as our staff. Uh, we will be bringing more detail on that because it is, it's a billion two in assets. So it's an important bucket. And then the 401 is off to a good start here. A couple years into it now, we're at 78 million. So with that, Tom, uh, if you could have the team take over the uh, performance updates on those two, please. Thanks, Jim. Uh, this is Britt Murdoch. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. 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 Great. Um, if we turn ahead to page nine, I'll highlight the DCP uh, or the 457 plan first. As you can see, we show the uh, assets and how they're distributed across the investment options on the left and where new participant contributions uh, went during the quarter on the right. Um, Consistent with prior quarters, you can see the U.S. large cap index and the stable value fund continue to hold the majority uh, or the largest portion of assets. They also received the largest portion of contributions, as you can see there on the right. Um, and then the retirement date funds, the target date funds, you can see hold about 19 percent of total assets and received approximately 14 percent of new contributions. If we turn ahead one slide. We'll detail the market values, uh, as Jim mentioned, total assets in the 457 plan, about 4.1 billion, uh, down slightly from the prior quarter due to uh, market volatility, as we have all seen. And in the interest of time, we'll move ahead to page 13, where we detail the target date fund performance. Um, as you can see, the volatility uh, is inherent with these portfolios as they're predominantly uh, equity in the later funds. Um, and certainly there is a return seeking component to all of the funds. Uh, returns negative 9% to about negative 5.3% during the quarter. They did track their benchmarks and indices uh, reasonably well for the quarter given the volatility. Uh, I would highlight for both the three and five years performance has been strong on both a relative basis compared to the BlackRock benchmarks, as well as to the Callan 
median peers, uh, which you can see there. So relative performance continues to be strong for the target date funds. And if we turn ahead two slides to page 15, we detail the individual investment option performance. Um, as you know, the majority of these funds, uh, except the stable value fund, are passively managed. Uh, you can see they do track their indexes adequately uh, and continue to perform in line with expectations. On pages 17 and 18, um, I just wanted to highlight the fund expense ratios on the far right-hand column. Um, you can see for the target date funds average about eight basis points uh, across the fund families, which rank very competitively uh, in terms of expense ratios. So they're very cheap relative to their peers. And on slide 18, we highlight the individual investment options as well, which all, again, rank very competitively relative to peers. Uh, lastly, I'll just touch on the stable value fund on page 19. Um, we do show performance, and you can see performance relative to both the T-bill as well as peers continues to be very strong. Uh, and I would highlight that two of the sub-advisors underneath the stable value fund are diverse and women-owned. I'll pause there, see if there are any questions on the 457 plan. Uh, and if not, I will jump into the 401A performance. Go ahead, Brad. Great. So in the 401A executive summary, if you could pull that up uh, and go to page nine. Again, just highlighting the asset allocation of participant assets versus new contributions. Uh, you can see the retirement target date funds uh, continue to hold the majority of assets in this new plan uh, where new participants are being defaulted into and most of the new contributions are also going to the target date funds, uh, which we view very positively uh, in terms of where participant assets are going. On page 10, we detail the market values. As Jim mentioned, uh, this relatively new plan continues to grow. Uh, assets about 78.2 million, uh, down slightly given the market volatility, um, but new contributions, you can see almost 10 million uh, as participants continue to contribute to this plan. Um, performance is shown on 13 and 14. Um, I will not reiterate the BlackRock target date fund performance, uh, given my comments on the 457 plan, but performance continues to be in line with expectations. And then on slide 15, we detail the individual investment option performance uh, and again, all of these funds are, are passively managed with exception of the short-term investment fund, which continues to do well. Um, and all of the investment options track their indexes uh, adequately and are in line with expectations. So with that, I will pause and I'm happy to answer any questions on the DC plans. No questions, okay. Thank you for that update, Cal and team. Appreciate that. Mr. Becker, if it's okay, we'll move on to the next performance item. Uh, that sounds great, please. Okay, great. So 5C and board docs, uh, backed by popular demand, uh, rather than having semi-annual reports from our private market teams, that being Stepstone on private equity and private credit and uh, NEPC on real estate, we've had inquiries to get uh, the more frequency on the report. So we're, um, we've moved to a quarterly process. So today you're gonna hear from uh, Mike Elio uh, and Matt Roach as well as uh, available to participate That's uh, for the private equity presentation. <clears throat> so 5C, if you open up the, I believe they'll go to the private equity one first, but I just wanted to jump ahead a little bit to page two and just point out why we're in, thanks Katie. Uh, must be page three of the Adobe. Or, yeah, there we are. Thank you. Uh, just want to point out that this uh, PME, the private market equivalent chart, shows 
This is why we have private equity. You can see over all those time periods, including the important since inception, significant outperformance, and this is net of fees, versus investing those same cash flows in and out of the market in public market equivalents. So that's an important thing to remember when we're having these meetings. Uh, private equity is complex. It takes more time. There's more legal involvement and so forth, but it certainly pays off. So I just want to remind the, the board, the committee of that, and uh, then ask Mike Elio if you go in and uh, cover the performance report. Sure. Sure. Thanks, Jim, and thanks, everyone. Uh, I guess if we can go back up to this entire slide, um, I, will, I will make sure that I cover this in the time allotted. Um, just so you know, for this quarter, this predates how we combined the private equity and credit portfolios into one report, so you will see this combined going forward. Um, but th for this uh, particular presentation, we will show you um, each individually. Uh, Jim stole my thunder. Uh, look, private equity for Q1 actually shows it continued to add value even as public markets started to crumble. Uh, if you do recall in Q1, public markets went down and kind of made a bit of a rally at the end of March. So a lot of the buyout folks did not have to take significant um, markdowns in Q1. Uh, I will say a lot of the venture space did. So um, the beauty of this portfolio, the tenure, the vintage year exposure, the diversification, um, the lack of a, a huge amount of venture in the portfolio allowed you not to experience uh, the downturn that a lot of the um, early stage growth or venture uh, venture managers experienced in Q1. So you can see that uh, the portfolio is still doing well um, uh, on a since inception basis. We did uh, add value of 68 million during the quarter, so that's, that's good. Um, what we really are going to care about, we'll talk about uh, next quarter is what happens in Q2. So just to, to make some preparations, uh, private equity marks were down anywhere from 4 to 7% during Q2. So you will see some sort of downdraft uh, on Q2. But to, to be clear, that 12.7% return from March as of June, uh, to give you the spoiler alert, it goes down to 126 So uh, luckily, again, the diversification of the portfolio um, will help you um, weather some of the storm. And the private markets, just to be clear, we didn't have the irrational exuberance uh, in late 2021 that the public markets had. So there, there was not as much of a drop to be taken as the public markets had. If you go to the next slide, Jim mentioned performance is good, performance is strong. So even with any somewhat headwinds, um, the public market marks um, are coming down for Q2. So if you jump ahead one more slide, um, you will see that even though right now we're just about on par with some of the public indices, uh, you will see those three gray bars on the right come down significantly in Q2. Um, and your portfolio, because of its diversification vintage, will show a lot less of that impact. Um, so just to stay on time, unless there are any questions, I'll flip over to the credit. Uh, presentation. There's a, a lot less to say there. Um, I don't know if you want to try and pull that one up, um, but I'll just keep talking uh, while we do that. That portfolio did continue to add value. If you switch to page one on the table, you can see 89 million of value was added um, and it was still contributing uh, positive performance in the portfolio. This portfolio, we have not made commitments, as you can see, in a couple of quarters. Uh, it's part of the reason we're folding this into the private equity portfolio in general. Uh, this portfolio will be, depending on uh, certain managers, will pay some, uh, face some headwinds uh, due to the increase in rates. And then, of course, the underlying nav of some of the credit investments will go down uh, to offset that. But uh, again, spoiler alert, I think uh, we're still at 1.3x. Um, as of Q2, so so not much more to add there. And you can see on the next slide, portfolio versus uh, the leverage loan index. You guys are just killing it in this portfolio. So um, a lot of cushion um, to maintain the outperformance that you've experienced to date. So unless there are no other questions, Jim, I think uh, I've used up my five minutes in the sun. 
Thanks, Mike. Nice job. You got it, pal. And, and good consulting work getting us into these uh, above average performers, uh, top, top quartile in, in many cases. Um, okay, uh, we'll move on to uh, the next item in 5D in board docs. And there we will bring in um, NEPC represented by Matt Ritter. Uh, he's going to talk about the real estate portfolio. Just a couple of things I wanted to point out uh, on real estate. It, as I mentioned earlier, it has been has struggled a little bit with SERS for various reasons. But I want to remind you, we do have uh, a new structure in place that we worked on over the last year, and the board approved it, and that is currently being implemented, uh, and that will take some time going forward, but I think you're going to see you're going to be very happy with the results that are coming on that. So we worked with Matt Ritter and the team at NEPC, and uh, we think that's going to be a much better mousetrap going forward. Uh, and I want to re reiterate what we said before, and, and Tom Shingler Callen mentioned real estate is one of the few things that we're experiencing positive returns out of uh, our portfolio this year. So that's a wonderful thing. This, this is where that diversification pays off, but we've also made it clear with Matt, and he'll talk about this, that we need to continue to contribute in up markets as well. So we think we're going to have that going on uh, all cylinders here. Give us a couple of years to get that implemented. So with that, Matt, if you could take it away. Sure. Great. Thank you, Jim. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll, I'll try to keep my comments relatively brief, but, but happy to answer questions as well. Um, I'll highlight the recent performance for the portfolio, um, a little bit of an overview of the portfolio composition, and then, and then a little bit of sort of looking ahead uh, to what the future might hold. So if we start on page two here, this is sort of the, the performance summary slide. Um, you can see the the SERS portfolio on an absolute basis had a had a strong first quarter. So this is yeah this is March 31 data. So year to date is the first quarter of nearly five percent return. Um, the uh, the portfolio over the trailing one and three year time periods also pretty pretty compelling 21 and a half percent roughly and and about 11 and a half percent. So we're we're very pleased with that. You, know, you do also see the NACREF Odyssey benchmark here, which is the, the benchmark. Uh, it comprises open-ended core real estate funds. Um, the Odyssey has posted really historically high returns, going back to the inception of the index. Um, the, the trailing one year is the highest, the highest that's ever been reported. So, um, you know, not not to say that uh, that's going to continue. I think we expect these returns to moderate from the historic high levels. But you know, the, I think the key message to walk away with is the recent performance of the real estate portfolio has been strong, and that the portfolio today is is healthy and and in a good position. And as Jim mentioned, you know, we've got the recent change in the sub strategy targets, which we'll be looking to implement um, to sort of further enhance the portfolio. So if we turn to uh, the next slide, uh, we break the portfolio down by strategy and by structure. Uh, fund structure. So on the left-hand chart, you can see the portfolio at the end of the first quarter was about 44% in core and core plus funds and 12% in REITs. So combined, that's about 55, 56%. That's the sort of the two pieces of the pie that we expect to, to bring down over the next couple of years as we implement the new, the new sub-strategy targets. The remaining portion of the portfolio is invested in uh, value add and opportunistic strategies, both funds and separately managed accounts. On the right hand side of the page, you can see the breakdown of those funds, um, sort of the top left uh, quadrant of that pie chart shows that really the vast majority of the closed end fund uh, value is invested in funds that are in their, the investment portion of their life cycle. Said differently, they are relatively early in their fund life cycle. If we turn ahead to the next slide, page four, we break things down a little bit differently and look at the exposure of the underlying holdings within the funds and the accounts, uh, both by property type and geography. 
SERS has a, a very mature and highly diversified portfolio. I probably sound a little bit like a broken record. I, I say that every quarter, but it's true. Um, so a great deal of diversification within the portfolio. Um, you can see on the left-hand slide here, um, highly diversified across the U.S., and about 17% of the portfolio is invested internationally, uh, most of which is, is, in, is in Europe. Um, on the, with regard to property types, on the right-hand side, again, high degree of diversification. Um, office makes up the largest portion there, um, but that's something we've seen sort of coming down gradually in recent years, while the industrial segment, the darker green there, um, has been the area that's the, the, the segment that has grown the most within the portfolio. Moving ahead to the next slide, um, uh, just looking at historical net cash flows for the portfolio, um, the real estate portfolio in general has been a net cash flow generator for SERS, which is uh, obviously gr a great thing. Um, in 2020, distribution slowed, not just for SERS, that was sort of a trend across the industry, um, but that, that's since picked up a little bit. So again, 2021 and, and in the first quarter of this year saw positive cash flow, um, cash flow activity for the portfolio. Um, the next slide, slide six, will sort of turn our attention to the future. Um, this reiterates the recent changes to the portfolio construction targets that Jim mentioned and, and I and I also mentioned earlier. Um, these were approved at the April committee meeting, so we will be um, decreasing the core and core plus and REIT targets while increasing the value add and opportunistic targets. Um, you know, these changes were made, as as Jim alluded to, really to, to try and increase the total expected return for the portfolio um, you know, while still maintaining the strategic allocations to core and, and REITs and so forth. So just thinking ahead to the future and the, throughout the fourth quarter, NEPC will be working with SERS, uh, with the investment office that is, to develop the updated pacing plan for next year. Um, which will focus not just on next year, but the years after that, sort of putting a plan in place to help us get to these new targets um, over time. You know, these are, we've got, um, it's a it's a large, slow-moving ship. You can't turn it on a dime, but we're going to start putting the, putting the steps in place to get to where we want to be. Lastly, on page seven, um, we just summarize kind of a high-level update on the market environment. Um, the the portfolio data on the on the SERS portfolio in this presentation is is through the first quarter. Uh, we try to bring things a little bit more current here. Um, so we we mentioned some data through mid year um, private core. As I mentioned, we it, it has moderated. We expect that to continue to moderate somewhat. Um, but even in Q2, um, performance remained pretty strong, posting nearly a five percent quarterly return versus a, a long term average that's uh, about half that. Um, and, and the other thing I'll just mention, the returns in the private real estate market you know, continue to be driven really by a large degree, to a large degree by the industrial and the apartment property types. Um, so that's been a consistent theme even pre-COVID, but particularly since 2020, um, you know, historically low occupancy and continued demand growth. Um, those are, you know, that's supply and demand, and uh, you know, that's that's resulted in really strong rent growth, and and as a result, um, strong valuation growth for those property types. Publicly traded real estate or REITs, um, meanwhile, for the first half of the year, follow the broader equity markets, um, and are are we're down about 20% through mid-year. Um, as we have noted, NEPC has noted in, in prior presentations um, and discussed with, with you all, um, you know, it's not that uncommon for public and private real estate to see divergences in the short term. There's periods where REITs, because they're publicly traded, can have a very strong quarter or a, a weak quarter um, in the short term, but over the longer term does tend to be more highly correlated with, with private real estate. Um, so again, not not completely out of the ordinary there. The real estate markets overall, though, you know, there's definitely some headwinds, some pressures resulting from the increase in in the interest rate environment. That means that you know, cost of debt, people borrowing to buy real estate, that's going up. Um, and for real estate, um, you know, valuations, there's some some sort of you know downward pressures as a result of the the rising yield environment. 
That said, the markets overall are still pretty healthy. Um, you know, investors are sort of digesting those interest rate rises and, and other macro trends, but there is still debt available. The, the property fundamentals underlying the, the holdings are still pretty healthy in terms of occupancy levels and, and sustained demand and so forth. Um, so by and large, the markets are, are healthy, but, you know, certainly some headwinds, some things we're keeping an eye on. Um, and then, you know, just on the, the last bullet here, I think, you know, we're going to talk about an opportunity later in this meeting, and, and certainly we'll have more opportunities for for you all to consider in 2023. So, you know, I want to end on a little bit of a positive note, which is we do think there are attractive opportunities for new investment in the market today. Um, and, you know, it's important to, to stick to and maintain that ongoing pacing plan. So with that, um, I think I've uh, used my allotted time here. I'll, I'll, I'll thank you all for listening and uh, happy to take any questions if there are any. No questions for Matt. Matt, thank you for that update and we're looking forward to the uh, results from the new program going forward. So thank you for all that research you did as well. Okay, yeah. Mr. Becker, I'll continue on. Uh, please, thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, item 5C in the agenda is our next, uh, as Mr. Becker mentioned in the beginning of the meeting, we're going to have a private equity opportunity presented to us. But I do want to take a minute here and point out this is a different private equity opportunity than you've been seeing uh, of late, uh, referred to as a secondary fund. It's an important part of the portfolio, as you're going to hear Mike Elio talk about in a minute. Uh, because of uh, what it offers to the system versus uh, our, our typical equity, uh, even technology focus or industrial focused uh, private equity opportunity. In particular, uh, there's typically a loss period when private equity programs are being funded out for the first couple of years. There's fees and expenses being incurred. Uh, referred to as a J curve. Uh, this is mitigated with this type of a strategy. Uh, it's not as high of return expectations, but it's a volatility dampener within within the program. Uh, and like I said, it has that positive sort of right out of the gate experience for us. So Mike's going to talk about uh, the importance of secondary funds and why this particular point in time is a good time to go into a secondary fund. Uh, and then following that, we'll bring on the Ardian team. Um, so uh, if we could open up the uh, CIO slides, yes, you're there, Katie, and go to the second page of the presentation, or page three, I should say, of the presentation. Just want to, was there a question? No, okay. Uh, just want to remind the, the committee that we're trying to work towards a 10-year target on pacing. Stepstone does this analysis for us, and you can see that we're uh, going to be a little bit below our target come 10 years with the current structure, but we're being a little conservative, and Stepstone will be updating our pacing analysis here at the December meeting, so there'll be more on that. But just want to remind uh, the committee that we're paying attention to this. Katie, if we can go to the next slide. In particular, this is how we monitor this. We look at each opportunity, and they're presented at all the committee meetings, and we track that. And you can see that we'll be on track to use the entire $1.1 billion budget uh, after our December meeting with uh, one more private equity company uh, coming in to present at that point. But just want to mention that the pacing is being followed, and we're on budget. Next slide, please, Katie. Uh, why did we pick this particular manager? Stepstone and the investment office researches everything that's out there and narrowed it down to this particular manager. First of all, as you can see uh, in the blue shading, those are all funds that we've been in with this particular manager. So it's a long-standing relationship. And you can also look at the total return that has generated uh, high double digits. And it's none of all fees and, and virtually non-existent loss ratio. Those are very uh, positive attributes. And then you'll notice at the very bottom of the screen, two other funds. Those are our co-investment funds, where that is an offset to uh, reduce the fees that we experience that aren't in the numbers above. 
So if you aggregated those together, you'd see even better results on this. So that's, we're, we're doing pacing. Uh, why did we pick this particular manager? That This is why we did that. Next slide, Katie. A couple of other things that have become important to this board is uh, diversity and transparency. Diversity in particular, you can see, we have been focusing on it as a committee over the years. We have been listening and working with the consultant to find opportunities that meet all our fiduciary obligations, first and foremost, but if we can also uh, build out some enhancements from the perspective of diversity, uh, uh, it's just another plus to consider. So you can see we've, uh, a little over a third of the portfolio has been allocated to diverse managers. The next slide, this particular manager, we've asked them about what they're working on. This is a woman, own firm, who I believe you're going to hear from today when the Ardian team introduces themselves in a moment. Uh, and this is uh, the bullets here cover, I won't read them, but those are the initiatives that are currently underway. And again, you'll hear from one of the Ardian representatives in more detail on this. So in a matter of time here, we'll, we'll just move to the next slide, please. Katie? And as I mentioned, uh, the transparency checklist, Ardian's agreed to uh, to uh, be transparent with, with their data for us on all measures. So that, that's a nice recap of uh, our pacing and why we picked this particular manager. And with that, if uh, Mike Elio would please step in and give us maybe a little bit of a primer education for the board on why we do secondary <laughs> funds and uh, how, how important it is at this particular time in the market given the volatility. Thanks, Mike. Sounds great, Jim. And uh, I know we have Dominique and Vlad on the call to talk about uh, Ardian specifically, um, but just to talk about portfolio construction and fit, as you know, we have spent a lot of time over the last few years uh, re-upping with our high conviction managers and focusing the portfolio in a more concentrated way while also trying to drive uh, better fees, better terms, uh, and savings across the portfolio. Uh, as, as the rest of the portfolio gets more concentrated, the Ardian and secondary uh, exposure that we have plays an even greater uh, importance, making sure that you still get diversification um, and can opportunistically go after things that we're seeing in the market on a more current basis. Uh, secondaries right now, I will say as a sidebar, we're entering a, a very interesting time in the secondaries market. I've heard it called the golden age of secondaries. Uh, Right, private markets love dislocation. Ardian has done incredibly well historically. It's one of our high conviction managers, and they've done it in a way with a very low loss ratio. So you'll hear from Dominique. They've had uh, a great stable team uh, that we've gotten to know uh, both at Stepstone and at uh, PA Serves over the years. Their loss ratio is 1%, which is half that of the secondaries market and significantly less than the 9% uh, across private equity in general. So again, diversification, stability, uh, low volatility, um, and also, so you're aware, as Jim mentioned, we're also doing a co-investment sidecar alongside uh, the commitment to Guardian's fund, which should only help us further diversify, get the exposure we're looking for, and do it in a much more fee-efficient fashion. So without stealing all the thunder from uh, Dominique and Vlad, I guess I will pass it uh, to the two of them, two of them. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Mike, for that recap. And uh, I just want to mention on our team, we have a portfolio manager, Jeff McCormick, who's recently joined us from uh, the legal department. He's heading up this this relationship, and analyst John Farrar are working on that. Uh, and with that, if uh, we could turn it over to the uh, Ardian folks, and uh, please introduce yourselves, uh, our board. We have uh, some new board members. They'd, they'd love to hear who you are, a little bit about your background, and then uh, take us through your material. And thank you. Dominique, I think you you are on mute. He's having okay. Thank you. Hello. Good morning. I'm Dominique Senequier, founder and president of Ardian. Um, I would like to start with a brief thank you. Uh, thank you to Jim Lunan and his team for their work and the support over the years, and thank you to this Board of Trustees for the trust you have placed in Ardian for nearly two decades. In 2004, Pennsylvania Thurs 
became the first uh, public uh, U.S. public pension investor with Ardian. So this is a very special relationship for us, uh, one that we hope to continue for very long, and especially with this uh, new fund ASF9. Ardian has developed quite significantly since uh, the first presentation to this board. Today, we have approximately 1,000 employees in 15 offices around the world. We manage $141 billion uh, across private equity, real assets, and credits. This includes $81 billion that is managed by the secondary and primary team that we present today. For ASF9, we target 15 billion um, fund size to continue the same strategy of investing in large portfolios of high quality US and European buyout assets on the secondary market. Vladimir Kolas will speak in detail on the strategy, team and performance, but therefore, before I pass to him, perhaps a few words on the market opportunity in secondaries. In short, uh, the opportunity is enormous and growing. Last year, secondary market volume was $134 billion, a record. This compared with dry powder in the secondary market of only 105, which will be deployed over two, three years, not in a single year. So there is a supply-demand imbalance that favors the buy side. The secondary market is fed also by primary capital that has been raised over a trailing five, six years period. And with nearly seven trillion of primary capital raised across private markets between 2016 and 2021, the supply of secondaries can only grow in the future. Further, the denominator effect caused by the decline in public stock portfolios, combined with the accelerated fundraising pace of general partners, has placed huge allocation constraints on many institutional investors. Many of these LPs are now looking to sell a portion of their private assets to free up some capital. These forces are currently created an unprecedented opportunity in the secondary market, particularly for large transactions where Ardian and ASF9 are optimally positioned. Now, Vladimir will speak in more detail about the fund and we can go to page three. Thank you, Dominique. And um, to, to actually to the to two more slides to slide five, please. Um, I would like to, to reiterate our thanks to the board for your, your partnership with Ardian now going on its 18th year. We're very proud of this partnership and uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you. Uh, I'll spend a few minutes summarizing our strategy and the market opportunity. Um, if we could just go to slide five, please. So our strategy is to purchase interest in private equity funds on the secondary market. We focus on buying buyout funds. We don't buy venture funds. We buy portfolios of buyout funds managed by high quality GPs that we are already investors with. We are investors already in 1,600 private equity funds. By transparency, that's around 10,000 private companies. So it's a huge amount of data that we receive every quarter from this portfolio, and it's private information that you can't buy on the market. You have to be an investor in these funds to get that information. And we're constantly exchanging with the GPs of these funds to get the latest information and re-underwriting these funds to identify which ones are attractive to buy on a given quarter. The second important part of our strategy is we like to operate at scale. We are the largest buyer in the market and we focus on the largest transactions, typically over a billion dollars in size where we see less competition uh, and higher barriers to entry. And so we can differentiate ourselves on other things than price, like speed of execution and certainty of execution. And thanks to that, we have had the, the benefit of getting over above market discounts, even though we're focusing on the highest quality funds. Now, to give a sense of the market that we're operating in, 
Uh, today, there are more and more sellers of large portfolios of private equity funds. Investors used to invest in private equity and hold these their assets or their investments to maturity. And now more and more institutions are actively managing their private equity allocation, sometimes because of a change of strategy, sometimes moving away from a geography or a GP, or like right now, because many plans are over-allocated, and so using the secondary market to free up allocation. Whatever the reason, despite its strong growth, the secondary's volumes today, it's only 2% of the total private equity industry that trades each year. And the private equity industry is growing very fast, as Dominique mentioned, and that percentage is increasing. More and more people are trading their private equity. So we expect a lot more growth to come for the secondary market in the coming years. And as Mike mentioned before, it's particularly exciting right now because you have uh, a little bit of volatility, and therefore the denominator effect is pushing a lot of groups to sell big portfolios on the market. And on the buy side, the, uh, in the buyer universe has really not changed much in the last 10 years. And so there's, it's one of the few areas of private equity that is undercapitalized at the moment, uh, with roughly one year of transactions available through dry powder. Through this strategy, we've been able to generate consistent, strong performance across our funds while mitigating risk by buying diversified portfolios and focusing on assets that we know very well. If we move to the next slide, you have a snapshot of the team managing the fund. Uh, given the nature of our strategy, it's a very data-intensive strategy. So we have a, a, the largest team in the industry, over 100 investment professionals. Uh, it's a homegrown team. We like to hire uh, people straight out of undergrad and, uh, and train them uh, at Ardian. And therefore, that's led to uh, long tenures. Uh, typically, our SMDs and ASF management committee members have been with the firm for an average of 16 years. And finally, it's also a truly global team. Uh, in addition to a very large U.S. team, because we have roots in continental Europe, we have very local teams in Europe and in Asia, uh, allowing us to build relationships with GPs and sellers and therefore access a differentiated proprietary deal flow that many of our U.S. competitors uh, don't seek. If we move to the next slide, uh, page 7, I, I already summarized the strategy, so I'll just focus on two or three of the competitive advantages we have. The first one is we have um, privileged relationships with GPs in the industry, because we're not just a secondary buyer, we're also an investor in private equity funds at their inception through our primary program. And that means we have very good relationships with the GPs, they, they like us a lot, and so we get better information uh, than most secondary buyers. Uh, and secondly, the, the relationships we have also mean we can provide certainty of execution to sellers. When you're selling a large portfolio of, let's say, 30 funds, you can imagine the amount of work needed to convince each GP to share their information with the potential buyers and then to get the approval from the GP to transfer to these buyers. Since we're already an investor in all these funds, uh, we can give a price quicker and we can also guarantee to the seller that the GPs will be happy to, to transfer to us. And finally, because we have large funds and co-investment mandates with our investors, uh, we're able to underwrite the largest transactions in the market. And so that makes us the really the quick and easy solution for a seller of a large portfolio, uh, and sometimes the only solution uh, when they want to sell two, three billion or more of private equity. On the next slide, you have <clears throat> our track record uh, in the secondary space. We started uh, in 1999 with ASF1 and since then have invested eight funds, generating a total performance of 175 and 23% gross, or 158 and 17% net. And you can see it's fairly consistent across our funds. Our worst fund, which went through the financial crisis, uh, did 162 and 12%, and our top performing funds between 1.8 and 2x and, and around 40% IRR. And the reason for this consistency is the strategy, as we mentioned, it's diversified, and it's also buying funds that we already know and, and invest with. These performances are, for the most part, realized uh, through distributions from the portfolio. We have high cash-on-cash -cash returns, but also through ourselves selling back those funds in the market after a few years when we feel like we've generated the upside that we were expecting. And so avoiding to, to hold on to assets for too long. We can see one example is Fund 5 that you all are investors in, it's a 2011 vintage that we're fully sold out of. Our most recent fund, Fund 8, uh, is performing extremely well at 1.8 and 40% IRR for a 2018 vintage fund. 
Uh, and importantly, it's not due to one or two star deals, but really a strong performance across the board. And Fund 9 is targeting 15 billion to continue the same strategy. You can see at the bottom of the page, uh, we generate a lot of co-investments for our investors because we do large transactions. $18 billion that we've offered since inception on a no-fee, no-carry basis. Uh, and State of Pennsylvania has been able to take advantage of this program, as we'll see on the next, on the next page. So page nine, uh, as we discussed, uh, our relationship with Pacers dates back to 2004. And through these 18 years of partnership, you've committed $495 million to Argent secondary products, generating a net multiple of 1.6 and a net IRR of 17%. And since ASF7, uh, we have worked with your investment staff to create a structure where Pacers invest $100 million in the fund and $50 million in a co-investment account to take advantage of opportunities on a no-fee, no-carry basis, which leads to a 33% discount on uh, expenses paid. And you can see the performance has been strong across Fund 7 and 8 and both co-investment accounts. And we intend to, to replicate the structure for ASF9. Now I'll pass the floor to Thea, Sustainability Director at Ardian, to highlight our engagement and progress on ESG issues. Thanks, Vlad. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Vlad mentioned, my name is Thea Calcutt, and I'm a director based in our New York office. I sit with an Ardian's nine-person strong sustainability team. Um, could you please move on to slide 10? Thank you. Ardian has been at the forefront of responsible investing since establishing our sustainability program in 2008. We were an early signatory to the Principles for Responsible Investment in 2009, and over time we've worked to incorporate considerations of ESG across our investment strategies. We launched our ESG approach in our secondaries and primaries portfolio more than 10 years ago in 2011. The core feature of our approach involves an annual ESG monitoring campaign where we ask GPs to complete a questionnaire that enables our assessment of their ESG, including diversity practices. Our investment team uses the GP ESG scores generated from campaign data as part of due diligence. We additionally share individual and benchmark scores and suggest opportunities for improvements with participating GPs themselves to encourage a strengthening of ESG practices across the portfolio. To move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Ardian considers diversity and equal opportunities to be a core focus within our sustainability program. With respect to our firm operations, we have made our commitment and objectives published uh, public through an inclusion and diversity charter published on our website. We further expressed our commitment to DE&I at Ardian within the industry and the communities where we work through our participation in several initiatives listed here on the slides, as well as donations focused on social mobility through the Ardian Foundation. Finally, we've sought to measure our progress on one of our priority areas, gender balance, by a third-party review through the EDGE certification process since 2020. In 2022, we progressed to the second of EDGE's three certification levels based on achievements such as the creation of our Inclusion and Diversity Charter, yearly gender pay gap assessments, gender targets for workforce composition, and a flexible working policy. That concludes my brief summary of some of Ardian's current sustainability program initiatives, and I'll yield the floor back to my colleagues. Excellent. Uh, is that is that the wrap up there, Vlad? Yep, that's the end of our presentation. Happy We're good. To take any questions? Great. Any questions for the Ardian team? Okay, great, great presentation. Thanks for keeping it moving along. We're running a little behind. Oh, sorry, Mr. Rocco. I didn't see you had your hand up there. Apologize. Please. So. Th th thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Um, I think the interest, the question I have deals with the data we had uh, ending March 31st versus the data we have as of uh, the end of the second quarter. And obviously, uh, public equity funds have had significant changes, um, but um, but I wanted to ask briefly that. Uh, the net IRR on um, our co-investments, you know, was triple digit. Um, 
and and it came back down to 98 percent you know a fall of potentially you know 67 percent and the net IRR of of uh, fund eight also um, you know had a significant double digit decrease in in between Q1 and Q2 just wanted to get your views on do you think this volatility potentially will continue and what types of risks um, with this volatility um, if, if we're seeing such significant markdowns uh, how does that impact uh, your strategy and returns thank you for your question um, in fact it's not actually uh, a markdown per se what happens in secondaries is we're buying assets at a discount and so day one we have a multiple that's positive on our transaction so if you buy a portfolio at let's say a 10 percent discount uh, on day one you're marked up to around 1.1 because we use as valuation the underlying funds valuation and so when you do a secondary transaction you have an immediate positive multiple and therefore the IRR at the beginning is extremely high because you've had a multi positive multiple with almost no time spent holding the asset and so it's natural for the IRR at the beginning to go down from that very high amount triple digits to somewhere more normalized uh, we, we typically target 17 percent uh, for our transactions so as a co-investment it would be a bit higher because you're, you save on the fees so typically the IRR would come down and stabilize in the 20s uh, after a few quarters and that's that's typically what's happening with your co-investment vehicle in fund eight is we did a few transactions last year at nice discounts with nice multiples right away but the IRRs will come down to the 20s uh, range uh, over time and uh, and similar with fund seven which is a little bit of an older fund but was able to do transactions up to last year and therefore a similar mechanism in terms of actual markdowns uh, in Q2 we observed similar similar to Mike in the industry is down roughly four percent our funds were down a little bit less than that I'd say in the, the one to two percent range but nothing missing it answer your question mr. Ako uh, um, I, I, I understand the answer thank you very much Great. Any other questions before we move to Mr. Becker for a motion? Okay, Mr. Becker. Okay, good. Thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Mike Uoyo and Marty and team for a very informative uh, presentation. Appreciate that. Uh, so we are ready uh, for the motion. I move that the investment committee recommend that the state employees retirement board commit one up to $100 million to ASF 9 LP and two up to $50 million to a sidecar vehicle that will co-invest alongside ASF 9 plus investment expenses and pro rata share of partnership operating expenses consistent with executed partnership documents as follow-on investments within the private equity asset class subject to successful completion of contract negotiations and execution and delivery of closing documents by all parties including required commonwealth legal approvals within 12 months it's been properly moved may I have a second please second thank you it's been properly moved we have and seconded uh, any further discussion before we go to vote anything further okay seeing nothing uh, may we have a roll call vote uh, please bill trump chair becker Aye. Senator DeSanto. Aye. Mr. Philman. Aye. Mr. Ocko, on behalf of Representative Frankel. Aye. Treasurer Garrity. Aye. Mr. Lindsay, on behalf of Senator Hughes. Aye. Mr. Jordan. Aye. Representative Schemmel. Aye. Ms. Soderberg. Aye. Secretary Thal. Aye. Mr. Flanagan, on behalf of Secretary Vague. Aye. Chair Becker, 11 yes, zero no. 
Great. Uh, thank you, Bill, uh, very much. And uh, the motion passes, and uh, congratulations, audience. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Jim, uh, Nolan, and, and the team. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Yeah. Thank you, Artie and team, and thank you for signing in, Dominique. Uh, okay, now we're going to move on to 5F in your board docs portal, uh, labeled a real estate opportunity, and that's going to be from one of our existing managers. And uh, Katie, if we could go to page three of the presentation in the CIO's introductory slides, just to refresh again on pacing. Uh, we're trying to target 10 years out because of the, the calls and distributions of private markets. It's, uh, it, it's a long-term process, uh, but we look like we're going to be pretty close targeting uh, about $210 million a year after this year. We had a transition year this year, as the chart shows. So we're looking to be pretty well on target. The next slide, please, Katie, shows uh, how, how we've allocated this year. It's a much smaller program real estate than private equity, but you can see that we did uh, another transaction uh, earlier this year, and then this will, this will wind up our uh, program for this year with Oak Street. Uh, next page, please. Why Oak Street? Uh, we covered the pacing, but why this particular manager? Well, this manager, uh, we have uh, been in three of their, uh, two of their funds so far. This will be our third fund. And you can see from the chart here why we uh, are, are favorable for this particular manager. When I say we, I mean the investment office as well as our consultant, Matt Ritter, who you'll hear from in a moment. Uh, but you can see the uh, returns uh, and the quartile rankings uh, stellar and an incredibly zero loss ratio on this. So this is a high quality triple net lease strategy. Uh, it's a great diversifier for our program. We can go to the next. Slide, please. Katie. Okay. Uh, again, this is a diversity chart. We, we bucket our private markets together here. Um, like, like we said earlier, over a third of our program has been um, allocated to uh, managers that have met the fiduciary obligations and, in fact, exceeded uh, uh, medians, top quartiles in many cases, but also offered a diversity. Uh, enhancement as well. So we're proud of that metric. Go ahead. This manager in particular uh, is what, what was a, a woman-owned found business originally, uh, and we, we allocated to the funds previously, as mentioned, uh, but uh, they are recently in the process. Well, I, I think it's, it's culminated now. They are officially a division of Blue Owl now, but Blue Owl also has a significant uh, uh, emphasis on DEI, which you'll hear from our presenter here in a couple of moments. Um, so very happy to once again have funds that generate the fiduciary obligations of returns, but yet offer us uh, this benefit as well. Next slide, please, Katie. And then finally, uh, Oak Street has agreed to uh, share all the data that we've asked in our board initiative a couple of years ago for transparency. Um, so that's also some good news. Uh, before we turn it over to Matt Ritter to talk about the portfolio fit, um, just want to mention uh, our team worked on this. We have Jared Snyder, our portfolio manager, headed up this initiative here with the support of Steve Belusha, our former Marine that is with the uh, organization, as well as Rob Borsky, who joined us from Treasury. Uh, a, a year ago, and uh, thank you to the team for all you did. A lot of work was done to put this together. Appreciate it. And with that, Matt Ritter, if you could uh, uh, cover the portfolio fit, sure appreciate it. Sure. Well, I, I think Jim hit a, a lot of the highlights, and this is a manager that many of you are are familiar with. Um, so I'll, I'll keep this brief. Try to keep us on schedule, uh, and then and then you can hear directly from the Oak Street team. 
Um, as Jim mentioned, SERS has invested in several Oak Street funds, uh, including in this fund, this closed end fund series, as well as the open ended net lease property fund. And so, you know, it's, that's part of the story here. I think a commitment to Fund 6 represents an opportunity for SERS to continue to build on an existing relationship, a strategic relationship with a, a top partner in the real estate space. Um, from a fund strategy standpoint, this will go into the value add and opportunistic portion of the portfolio, which, as we just talked about about a half hour ago, is, is an area that serves currently underweight to, especially given the new target allocations that we have. Um, and then just in terms of portfolio fit and, and the strategy itself, um, you know, you'll certainly hear more about this from the manager, but um, similar to the prior funds, the Oak Street Blue Owl team will will focus really on high credit quality tenants with an emphasis on generating strong, reliable current income. Um, however, that income is not coming at the expense of total return. As you saw the returns that Jim presented, the, the total returns have been quite strong. Um, so I think that combination with the long-term contracted cash flow, but still potential for high total return, is something that you know is compelling in any market environment. But um, you know, in in periods of uncertainty or or potential uncertainty, um, is is even more attractive. So I think this again, it's it's a top manager, a strategic relationship for SERS, and really a, a compelling uh, investment strategy. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it, uh, I guess, either back to you, Jim, or, or, or to the Oak Street team themselves. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And yes, let's, let's do that. We are running a little bit behind, so appreciate that. Uh, yes, if the Oak Street team, now Blue Owl, uh, would kindly introduce yourselves for the board, for any new board members who haven't met you previously when you've been in the boardroom physically. We're in this virtual world now, but please take it away and then uh, go through your material. Thank you. Great, Jim. Thanks so much. Uh, and, and Matt, thanks for, for your uh, your kind words about Oak Street. Uh, my name is Gary Rozier, Managing Director uh, in the Oak Street Division of Blue Owl. Um, and my job is sort of split uh, in two ways. One, I manage the day-to-day -day of the business with uh, our founder, Mark Zarr, uh, but also sit on the uh, investment committee uh, and run our uh, investor communications team as well. Uh, always a pleasure for me to be in front of this body. Uh, I am a Pittsburgh native and have uh, family all the way from Pittsburgh uh, across Western PA through Harrisburg. So, uh, to be able to serve uh, this system, uh, who has served my uh, family and neighbors for so many years, uh, is a real pleasure and a real honor for me. So thank you for that. Uh, you'll hear from my colleague, Tracy Hart, uh, in a little while to talk through uh, our DEI efforts and uh, the many things that her and her staff have been doing to make sure that we maintain the integrity of the business from that side as well. Uh, if you'll go to the next slide, slide two, um, our relationship with, uh, with, with this system has, has gone back for some time. Uh, been very important to the Oak Street business. Uh, in a number of ways. Uh, but our division was founded in 2009 here in Chicago. All 40 employees are, are in Chicago that manage the portfolio. Uh, we were started in the heels of, of GFC with the idea that we wanted to create a strategy that provided a lot of downside, but also provided clarity of income as well as, well as higher returns. And over the course of our history, uh, we've been able to accomplish that. Uh, and this system has certainly benefited from that. So our first investment uh, with Facers was back in 2017. That was our Fund 4 uh, vintage, which we are uh, almost uh, finished selling down at this point. Current returns there, a, a net 29 IRR. Second investment came in 2019, and very important for us because it was the launch of our first semi-liquid drawdown fund. Uh, and, and again, this system was a founding investor uh, with a large commitment. Uh, and, and over three years now in that fund, we've delivered a net uh, 39 IRR as well, um, so great returns. Patriots made the third investment uh, in our Fund 5, uh, and I had the opportunity to be in Harrisburg in front of you in person at that time. It was the last meeting I did before COVID, uh, and, and the system made a $50 million investment there, which, again, very thankful for. We've got about 80% of that $50 million committed at this point, uh, and returns are falling in line uh, with the first uh, two investments made. So, again, today we're looking to uh, uh, establish another uh, a commitment from the system in our Fund 6 which we will be launching here in the next uh, 30 days, and that fund will follow the exact same strategy that we have executed on since the beginning of our uh, our business. So nothing's going to change there. And again, we hope to deliver the same returns uh, in that commitment as well. Um, important to our business, uh, we've been able to scale the strategy in a very meaningful way. So Fund 1 was a $20 million fund. Current Fund 5 is $2.5 So what you've seen is nice steady growth there 
while keeping the strategy the exact same. What we were not able to do with, in the same token was scale our business uh, as fast as the funds were scaling. Uh, so what we did was partner with uh, Blue Owl Capital, uh, which was a great alternative platform uh, that had two very significant businesses that really allowed us to focus on the investment side of the house while our parent Blue Owl takes care of all the non-investment functions. And that has made us a much stronger organization, allowed our team here in Chicago to focus, like I said, more on the investments, more on your portfolios, spending more of our day-to-day -day on picking very good investments. So incredible acquisition. As, as, as Matt mentioned, prior we were a minority and woman-owned firm, which is very important to us as a business. So we wanted to make sure that we were partnering with an organization that had that same philosophy, had that same point of view. And again, you're going to hear from Tracy on, on the things that we're doing on that front. If you will, uh, move to page uh, five for me. What you will hear from me and, and from Matt and our great partner, Steve, uh, on your staff, who is one of our LPAC members and just a great counselor for us, is you're going to hear the term net lease or triple net lease a lot. And in summary, what that means is we structure all of our leases such that all the operating expenses are borne by our tenants. Okay, so when we buy an asset and lease it back to that, that uh, particular company, all of the expenses are their responsibility. We love that as, as an asset owner because we're not responsible for those things. It is, it's the responsibility of the tenant. That basically means we receive net rent or cash flow above and beyond all of those things. So as we sit in a time like today where you have interest rates moving up, you have inflation pressures, we're not affected by those things in a major way because much of it is going to be borne by the tenant or their responsibility. Now, that structure is only as good as the ability of that tenant to be able to pay all of those things they're committed to. So we've drawn a hard line historically at Oak Street of only working with investment grade rated tenants. So going back to what Matt had mentioned, we want to make sure that we have a lot of downside in our portfolio. And we do that by having a very strong tenant in the building. So every tenant and every single asset that we own and have owned are all investment grade rated. And again, that basically ensures that our cash flows are contractual for a long period of time with a tenant that's a, that's a ability to pay is extremely high. Now, we will do that in a couple of ways we think it's important. One is with long duration leases, which means we have longer contractual cash flows. The other important thing there is <clears throat> we want to be buying better than market. So the way we source is vastly different than what you'll hear from a lot of other real estate managers. And what that is, is we don't go to a company and say, we like that real estate you have, we want to buy it from you. We actually engage companies with the CFO or treasurers and say, we think you have a better and higher use of your capital than servicing real estate. Let us monetize and take it off your balance sheet, put that capital back in your hand. So essentially what we are is a capital transaction partner to those companies. And we can do that at scale, we can do that at speed, and with almost certainty of execution. Because we can provide all those things to a company, we are going to get far better pricing. So when you've seen the high returns that you've experienced in the system with our funds, a lot of that comes because we are getting better pricing than others in the marketplace. The other important piece there that I want to mention, and Matt also brought it up, is that, of course, real estate may be facing some tougher times in the future with higher cap rates, higher interest rates. And that is true of most real estate strategies. Ours is a little bit different. When you go through a, a time of disruption, companies need our capital more. But that actually allows us to put more capital out or deploy more capital. And we can drive pricing in terms much better in those environments. We've historically done that during times of disruption. That makes me very excited about this Fund 6 Vintage because I feel like we will be able to walk into that vintage with an opportunity set that's wider than it's ever been in, in Oak Street's history. So again, acknowledge the fact that we are facing some disruption, but that is very good for our investment strategy. Provides a lot of opportunities for us. So jump to uh, slide nine for me. One of the things we're most, we're, we're most proud of in our portfolios, this is what I call my zero page, and basically what this says is we have never had a bankruptcy in our portfolios. We've never had a tenant default. We've never had a single missed rental payment. That includes COVID going all the way back to our inception. We have had every tenant pay us on time every single month with no disruption. And we've never had a vacancy in our portfolio. And the way we structure our leases, even if that were to happen, that tenant is contractually obligated to pay us all the way through the life of our lease, which means your cash flow is not disrupted. So that 8% we pay you every single month has never been disrupted. Next page. Performance for us, again, extremely proud across all of our close-end funds that are fully realized. And, again, Pacers has participated in much of these. 
weighted average 25% net IRR. In our open-end strategy, where the system was a founding investor, we delivered a net 39% since inception. This is last quarter. That 8% that we say we pay you, we pay that every single month, have never missed a monthly payment. We were actually on 151 consecutive months at this point, so very proud of that history as well. If I can close by just saying our goal has always been to provide a strategy that, again, had a lot of downside protection that is paying you high current income with the ability for more upside. We are extremely proud to have delivered that to the system, and we hope we'll have the opportunity to serve you again in Fund 6. It's been a great relationship for us. Again, I've got to thank Steve for his partnership and his counsel. We've come to Steve on a number of things that we've done within the business as a partner, and Steve has given incredible counsel to us, so we are extremely pleased with our relationship. Couldn't be more excited to serve you in the capacity we have, and hope we have the ability to do that again in the Fund 6. Now, if I could pass it over to my colleague Tracy to talk through our DEI efforts. As I mentioned before, Oak Street was founded as a woman in minority-owned business. So any, any firm we were going to partner with was going to have that same point of view and that same tenacity towards making sure that was embedded into the business. And Tracy does a fantastic job. So, Tracy, if you'll share with the board the things that we're doing at Blue Isle, uh, I'd appreciate it. Take it away. Yes, I'm, I'm so, so happy to, to meet with you all today um, and talk to you and really brag about our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. So if we can... Um, Go forward to the next slide, please. Next one. So this is our, a little long, um, diversity policy statement. This is one of the first things that we put together when we formed um, the, the Blue Owl, as, as you are getting to know. It was the most important thing is to set what is our mission? What do we want to achieve here? Um, so I won't read the entire policy, but DEI is critical to our internal environment. It's how people feel about working at Blue Owl, how candidates see us, and of course externally to how our investors see us. We believe everyone has a part to play in our DEI efforts and environment from our most senior people to our most junior and it's really embedded in our core values of mutual respect, excellence, constructive dialogue in one team. Next slide, please. So this shows you how our DEI efforts are organized. Um, this is actually a bit of a work in progress. And, and if I can present to you at some point in the future, you will see this revised. Um, we are bringing our DEI efforts under a corporate sustainability umbrella that we will closely partner with our ESG efforts and our um, citizenship or our philanthropy efforts. We feel like those three pillars can leverage one another really effectively to how we're viewed and how we continue our DEI efforts. But um, this is generally similar to how we will set it up under our corporate sustainability. As you can see that our executive sponsors are at the top of the house. So they are, they are our co-presidents, Mark Lipschultz and Michael Reese. They continually want to see progress in this. They're not just there just to have their name on this um, slide, but I report to them at least on a monthly basis on the um, progress that we are making as well as get them involved in any of the um, firm-wide initiatives that we are undertaking. If we can go to the next slide, please. So this is information on our employee networks. You may hear them often referred to as employee resource groups. So earlier in 2022, our first network that we rolled out was called is called the Parliament. That is our women's network. And in case you're wondering where the name came from, a parliament is um, actually what is a group of owls is called. It's not a herd. It's a parliament of owls. So we thought that that was a, a great name for our efforts. In March, during International Women's Day, we had an event um, for our most senior people and our women of the firm. And we had a guest speaker, Carla Harris, who was a senior client advisor at Morgan Stanley. She um, is also named to Fortune Magazine's um, 50 Most Powerful Black Executives in Corporate America. And she's an author and a musician. 
And if anyone is interested, Google her and check out some of her speeches on YouTube. She's truly, truly an amazing inter um, an, uh, executive and person in general. She's really a captivating speaker. Um, we also had um, another event over the summer, which was really just all of us women meeting and talking because we tend, you know, we can work in silos and we don't always have an opportunity to meet together. Um, so we had that in in July and um, Oak Street's very own Larissa Herxig is also on the Parliament Steering Committee. We will roll out two more employee networks, um, our Pride Network and our Family Network that we're calling New to the Nest. It is important that people understand that Blue Owl respects balance in our lives. Um, so we've had a lot of people ask about family network. Let's share stories on how we all manage family along with work. Next slide, please. Some of the focus areas as part of our DEI initiatives um, is obviously on recruiting. So this is something I feel really strongly is that there is no perfect panacea for how to recruit diverse employees. It's, it's working with a diversity recruiter. It is making sure that our hiring managers and the people that interview understand um, the difference in the recruiting and how to sell the firm from a recruiting perspective. We also have um, a referral program where we really focus um, our referrals on diverse candidates and it's working away and this is something we just have to chip away at. Um, we also have a focus on training and this year's focus is on unconscious bias. Um, we had a really incredible speaker, um, Dr. Banaji from Harvard, who really coined the phrase implicit bias through her research. And again, she doesn't have a lot on YouTube, but if you can read anything about her, if you have any interest in unconscious bias, she is really um, incredible. And we opened her session up in July to the entire firm, and we had hundreds of people attend the 90-minute session. She's really incredible. Um, to couple that, uh, Dr. Banaji's online Zoom session, we're also going to have other training on unconscious bias. Um, so some on-site sessions in smaller groups so we can talk about how to recognize unconscious bias in yourselves and how to work around it. Um, and also some online courses where people can just be more introspective and consider these things while they're at their, at their own desk. So we will roll these out um, in, in Q1. Um, we also have begun a pilot program for um, moms with you know, having going out, especially as they're going out after having their first child. So we have a specialized executive coach that will work with the employee and their, the employee's manager, which to me is so critical on how to manage your career before you go out on leave, while you're out on leave, which you should not be working when you're out on leave, um, and how to manage your transition back. So we have two um, senior women who are running with this and, and are going to be our pilot. They're both due in December, so I'm really um, curious and very interested to hear what kind of feedback they have. But it's, I'm really excited about this program. Um, and also our philanthropy. So we're developing our corporate giving program. As I said earlier, we are going to have a separate bucket under our corporate sustainability around our philanthropy and corporate citizenship efforts. So we, um, I hired a junior person who is going to work on helping us institute um, charitable giving campaigns, working on board memberships of underserved communities as well. Um, next slide, please. Uh, these things I'm, I'm particularly proud of, and these are continuing to grow um, really as we speak. So we partner with several organizations that we feel will really give us an opportunity to add value to our efforts internally as well as externally. 
Um, SEO, Sponsors for Educational Opportunities, is a quite a well-known organization, especially in financial services, working with underserved communities and students. We um, are a corporate sponsor for their winter gala, and we're also working with them on other galas and, and other opportunities, as well as internship programs. We um, recently became, actually it's not a silver corporate sponsorship anymore, it's actually a gold sponsorship for 100 Women in Finance. It was formerly called 100 Women in Hedge Funds. Um, we, next week we will have an introductory call with the CEO of 100 Women in Finance and all of our women at Blue Owl to learn what a partnership with this um, organization includes, and we are also giving away 100 memberships to this organization. Again, if you haven't heard of them, check them out online. Incredible organization. Um, they have 500 members, and across the globe, I'm particularly excited about this because it gives our uh, women in London and in Asia an opportunity to really participate in some of our DEI efforts that was always hard to do with, with time zones and not being in the same location. Um, uh, another organization we're newly working with is Black Women in Asset Management. They have been um, really focused on the UK market um, and they started out with eight members and are now up to a thousand. We um, are sponsoring an event in October where they are going to have all of their members have a development and networking day and we'll have three women from our UK office attend and meet with their members. We are also a um, U.S. founding sponsor. This just happened last week, which is why it's not on this slide. They are looking to grow their membership in the U.S., and we will be one of their founding sponsors in the U.S. as they continue to grow in this. And I am so excited about this. We will work with them and their members on speakers, on um, mentoring, and possibly some internship programs. We also uh, partner with Opportunity Network. This is really in the U.S. at this point, although they have done so, we have had some of their internships sponsored in the in the U.K. This is an organization that works with high school and college students in underserved communities. Um, they we have uh, at least four. We're looking to add a, a few more um, of their internships over the summer. And we have had really, really great success with this organization. We did partner with them to celebrate Black History Month. Um, and we had 28 of their students um, to, uh, on site at Blue Owl. And they had a day of really learning who, who is Blue Owl, what is private credit, what is a real estate investment program, um, and to give them an opportunity to learn who they are. Uh, and then we can, you know, we hold on to their resumes in case we have open roles that we could have them apply for. Um, so that is really, and I think that's our last slide. Can you um, just skip to the next one? Yeah, it is. So I hope that this gives you a flavor for how important this, um, the, all the DEI efforts are at Blue Owl. Um, I'm happy to take any questions, and, and please reach out to me after this session if you'd like to learn anything more about any of the efforts that, that we have. Okay, we have a question. Representative Schimmel. Very well, yeah, thank you so much, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, just two questions. Uh, first, uh, since DEI seems to be a big part of your presentation, and I guess a part of uh, what you would say is a reason we should invest the uh, uh, the pension funds money. Um, the uh, the prospective employees that you have, do you have questions that you ask prospective employee candidates regarding DEI or their unconscious bias? So, do you mean from an interview perspective, or do you mean you know what? How would they like to be involved in our efforts? And probably from an interview perspective, uh, you know, as you grow your own diverse workforce. And, and maybe you don't. That's I, I just didn't know. 
Yeah, we don't we don't ask anything specific. Um, when we have people apply for roles, we are rolling out a new information system so that when we get applicants, we ask some ethnicity and gender questions so that we could have a better analysis of who is applying for our roles. Um, so that's something new we're putting in place. Um, we don't have, you know, our questions and our interviews are pretty open-ended, but I can assure you that the people who interview, they also clearly understand um, the importance of, of the efforts. Um, so want to have people that work with us that feel the same way, if that, if that answers your question. Sort of. Um... Well, moving on then, I wonder if we could just obtain a list of the charities to which Blue Owl contributes. Uh, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Yes, I can. Sure. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for that, Representative. Any other questions for the team? Okay. If not, we'll turn this back over to Chair Becker. Okay. Thank you, Jim. And uh, thank you, um, Oak Street team, Gary and Tracy, and uh, as well as uh, uh, Matt Ritter and the uh, investment office team. That was a very, uh, a very uh, interesting presentation. We appreciate that. And I think we're now uh, ready for uh, a motion. And uh, I move that the investment committee recommend that the state employees retirement board commit up to $75 million to Oak Street Real Estate Capital Fund 6 LP plus investment expenses and pro rata share of partnership operating expenses consistent with executed partnership documents as an investment within the real estate asset class subject to successful completion of contract negotiations and execution and delivery of closing documents by all parties, including required Commonwealth legal approvals within 12 months. Uh, may we have a second, please? Second. Thank you. Uh, it has been properly moved and seconded. Any further discussion before we go to vote? Rep Schimmel, you okay. still have your hand up, or is that from the prior? I, I do, yes. Okay, sure. Yeah, uh, since DEI seems to be a consideration, heaven knows why, since it's actually not in our mandate from the legislature as to what SIRS should be doing with its investments, it seems to me like I don't know enough about the DEI strategy, the charitable giving, the employment policy of Blue Owls. So I'm going to vote no. That is not a rejection. They might be an excellent candidate. I simply don't know enough about them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Representative. Any anything? Anyone further? Uh, Mr. Ako has his hand up, Chair Becker. Okay, sure. Uh, Dan, um, uh, uh, thank you, Chairman Becker. I think this board has really um, benefited from the expertise of different board members over the years, and I can recall we had a board member uh, appointed by Governor Corbett um, who. Uh, uh, the former chief counsel with an expertise in real estate. And when we've discussed this proposal, so these, the, this fund in the past, um, uh, that board member really explained the advantages of the triple net uh, lease and what it means in terms of trying to be an investor. So from an investment perspective, um, I think this is one of our best real estate funds in the past. And uh, it's it's impressive returns and and rely on the expertise of 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 some of our previous members who have real estate experience. Uh, this really sounds like a strong uh, a strong investment. Uh, thank you, uh, Dan. Any uh, further questions or comments? Uh, seeing none, uh, may we have a roll call vote, please, of Bill Trump. Chair Becker. Aye. Senator DeSanto. No. Mr. Philman. Aye. Mr. Rocco. Aye. Treasurer Garrity. Aye. Mr. Lindsay. Aye. Representative Schemmel voted no. Ms. Soderberg. Aye. 
Secretary Thal. Aye. Mr. Flanagan. Aye. Mr. Jordan. Aye. Thank you. Nine yes, two no. Thank you. And uh, so the motion passes, and congratulations uh, to uh, Oak Street. And uh, I think, uh, Jim, I'm going to turn it uh, back to you. Okay, thanks, Chair Becker. Uh, we are uh, quite, a, quite a bit behind schedule here, so uh, we're going to try to move along a little bit quicker here. Uh, we have the next item in 5G, is in golf, on the agenda with the asset liability study. Callum performs asset liability studies for us every three years, I believe it is, and uh, we're, we're due for another one. The good news on this particular meeting is we did a lot of work on asset allocation over the last year and a half or so, and we have uh, modified the allocation. Thank you for your support on that. We did make significant changes, so we're not making any today. You can sit back and enjoy the ride here. We don't have a recommendation coming uh, out of this presentation. And I just want to reference a couple of pages in the asset liability study that uh, Katie has put up on the screen for us. Katie, you don't have to jump to these pages. I just want to mention them to the committee. Page 13 shows our current target in a higher and lower risk strategy that Callan developed for informational purposes only. Uh, page 15 shows the probability of our current allocation meeting the board's uh, now expected rate of return that was agreed upon uh, at the previous meeting uh, of over 52%. So that's moving in the right direction. And then finally, in the appendix on page 26 for your um, leisure reading is all the asset classes, expected rates of return and uh, risk metrics. So that's something that is of interest to some IC members. I just wanted to point those slides out. And with that, Tom, we're running uh, quite a bit behind. If you could introduce your team, I see you have Jay on there as well, and uh, take her away. Actually, I will. Uh, I will just go ahead and jump right in. This is Jay Klepfer. I'm in San Francisco. Um, I'm with the uh, Capital Market Research Group. Also with me today is Kevin Matches, who actually did a lot of the heavy lifting. So I'll I'll kick it off, and then <clears throat> I'll ask Kevin to take you through the detail of the analysis. We are under understand you are on a time constraint now, so. We will be uh, <clears throat> concise. If we could turn to slide two, please. <clears throat> I could just quickly summarize why we're doing this. So we, we look at funding, we look at liabilities, we look at cash flows, and we help you select an appropriate asset allocation. As Mr. Nolan pointed out, you already have selected one this year, so this is really more confirmation than anything else. You have made big changes to your plan since we started working with you, <clears throat> um, I guess about six years ago or five years ago. Uh, so what this includes then is your return target, <clears throat> um, you know, your focus, we, we've listed what we understand your goals are, to maintain or reduce investment management fees, to maintain or increase liquidity, and to identify and mitigate plan risks. And, you know, an asset liability study is nothing but an examination of what are the risks in the plan and what are the opportunities. So the bottom half of this page just shows that what we're going to take you through uh, in the next couple of minutes. If we could turn to slide three, please. Asset allocation is the single biggest decision you as a board will make for this fund. Um, we just heard great presentations from the managers, but that's after you decide you're going to be in private equity, you're going to be in private credit, you're going to be in real estate. Uh, this is the really big top line <clears throat> decision you make. And when we do this every three years, we're now knitting together investment policy, which is what you're making a decision on today, funding policy and benefit policy. And we do that with what we call an asset liability model. So we set up a model that mimics what your actuary has provided you in terms of the uh, actuary evaluation, which you just reviewed with them in a couple of, uh, a couple of months ago. The funding policy, how the benefits will be paid is modeled. And then we look at the investment policy and see how they all interact uh, over time. And that's really how we get at you know, coming to an answer about asset allocation. If we go to the next slide, please, I'm going to take a very short but important detour about to talk about the capital market assumptions. <clears throat> Callan released some assumptions in January of this year, and embedded in that 
was the dark blue line that's shown on this chart, which is a 30-year path to interest rates. What happened this year? Well, the market went bananas. The Fed really started raising rates, and the market believed them. And within the first couple of months of the year, the market fully priced in all the Fed moves. So that red dotted line is showing that you know we reached where we thought we would be in, in interest rates you know, five months into the year, uh, and that is coincident with where we thought we'd be 13 years from now. <laughs> so quite a dramatic shift. <clears throat> so we stopped. We watched this very, very carefully. And as of June 30th, we recast our forecast, and we're calling it the preliminary 2023 assumption, assuming that the rate levels where we were uh, at the end of June will hold to the start of the new year. And we think that's important, and I'll show you what the impact is on returns for anyone doing an asset liability study in the second half of this year, which is you know, your plan. If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, this looks very busy, but what I'm trying to get at here is show how important it is to bonds. Let's look at the bottom line across. Those are the components of a bond return. The, the uh, line green is the total return. And then there's the yield, and the teal part is capital appreciation. The orange part, which you can barely see, is downgrades or defaults. And then there's a notion of something called a rule yield. But if you compare 2022, top and bottom, you can see there was a big shift up in rates, which causes value to fall in your fixed income portfolio. So our expectation was a modest loss this year. It turns out it was not a modest loss uh, using our expectations. It's going to be more like almost 9% for the year using our this projection. So that will trace through to all the fixed income expectations. Uh, we, if you go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> These are the changes we made, and we were, th we were very thoughtful about this. We started working on this in April. We you know, considered what was going on through the markets and what was happening in the yield curve and examining what the Fed was up to. Um, and then once we had data through the end of June, we made this change and you know, issued what we call our preliminary 2023 assumptions. The biggest change is to fixed income. So the aggregate total return at the start of the year was 175. We've now boosted it to 390. Um, so you may scratch your head and go, well, why is it so much better? Well. The single biggest component or driver of a return forecast for fixed income is the starting yield. And the starting yield jumped a lot for the aggregate in the first four months of the year, the first five months of the year. So our return for the aggregate is now at 3.9. So that's the second line down, second line from the bottom in that table here. Uh, cash is now 2.4. We made other changes across the fixed income spectrum, and then a much more modest change to equity. Essentially there, we made two changes. One is we boosted our expectation for inflation from two and a quarter to 250. I'll speak to that in just a moment. So we believe that will pass through to equity. <clears throat> we also now believe, given the repricing of equity, that it's, it's much more in line with history, the valuation is, and we had a penalty on equity before, and we've taken that 25 basis point per year penalty off. So equity returns are now 50 basis points higher, you know, give or take a few basis points for all the equity asset classes. Inflation in particular was an area of great concern for us. Um, and I know the, the recent prints that come out of um, the Department of Labor for CPI have been, you know, 8.3 and 8.1 because that's measured on a year over year basis, which is very appropriate. I think what's interesting, though, is I believe inflation is flattening, finally. If you look at the print from June to July, July to August, they're essentially flat. So year over year, they're still gargantuan, and they frighten everyone. Um, but the, as we dig into you know, what the Fed is uh, planning to do, they're now going to raise rates another 100 basis points, further than what they said just a couple months ago, through the end of the year, to get up to about 4.4% as an average. The market believes the Fed is doing what is necessary and has fully priced in all these changes. Um, and, and it's hard to find a forecast for inflation that's above two and a half by the end of next year. And so we have, we've nudged up our forecast. We could definitely be wrong. You know, this could go on for longer. There is no doubt. And we have an open mind about it. 
but we have nudged up inflation from two and a quarter to two and a half, which I know it doesn't look very much compared to what we're talking, uh, you know, what you've seen in the, the headlines, but this is a 10 year projection. So slide seven, if you go to the next slide, um, shows all of our capital market expectations. There's more detail there and you probably want to go through. But it's important to note that there's the expectation now for our preliminary 2023, what we were saying eight months ago, nine months ago, and the difference. So again, the bigger differences are concentrated in fixed income because of that big shift upward in the yield curve. <clears throat> if you could turn one more page, we do some customization of our capital market expectations for uh, PA SERS, and these are the three asset classes in particular. So for opportunistic fixed income, we use private credit as a proxy, and that return expectation is up 100 basis points compared to the start of this year. So coming in at six and a half. Uh, we also use treasuries in your portfolio. That's also up by almost 200 basis points. And then the real estate composite um, is a combination of core, REITs, and non-core, and that is up about 50 basis points just uh, as we refresh these expectations. So, so these expectations we used to then build out the asset liability model. So I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to turn it over to Kevin to take you through the rest of the, the, li the actuarial liability model. But if you have any questions, please, you know, uh, please come forth. Great. Thank you, Jay. Let's uh, turn ahead to page nine here. And so uh, what you'll see, uh, the upshot of what Jay just talked about is these two tables in, in kind of the bottom here, uh, the key count assumption uh, based on those preliminary 2023 capital market assumptions uh, has increased uh, counts 10 year expected return from the 6.32% that you all have seen before uh, to now 7.24% return. And so um, you know, there's been a lot of comparison in, in prior meetings to uh, the key actuarial assumptions uh, that you work with Corn Ferry on, you know, and that did uh, get reduced to 6.875%. And, you know, you, I think, may recall from prior meetings with Cal on that, you know, we don't advocate uh, necessarily changing investment policy uh, to match Callan's expected return uh, with that uh, actuarial assumed uh, discount rate. And you know that remains true whether your expected return that you get from Callum is below that discount rate as it was before, or whether it's now above the discount rate. <clears throat> In the top right of this this chart, uh, what you'll see is uh, your financial position from the actual valuation valuation report as of December uh, 31, 2021. And in the next page, uh, what we're doing here in this uh, kind of bottom left table on uh, slide 10, you'll see here uh, we're rolling forward um, that assumed financial position to the end of 2022. And what we're doing there is we're assuming uh, that the uh, bad performance uh, that has been experienced in markets uh, due to the war in Europe uh, is going to, to flow through uh, to the assets. And so that's going to uh, result in a hit uh, to the funded status. Um, you can see there on a market value basis, um, is going to fall to 63%. And that's where we assume you start at before we do our projections utilizing the preliminary 2023 capital market assumptions that Jay just talked about. And so to do that, uh, we're going to look at this target asset allocation, which is comprised of 75% return seeking assets and 25% of capital preservation assets, as well as some alternative asset mixes. So let's turn uh, to slide 11. And First, let's start by looking at um, the current asset allocation and assuming that uh, expected return continues out even beyond Callan's 10-year horizon and, and out to 20 years um, in what we call a deterministic forecast. So this is a single scenario assuming that all the assumptions come, come true over time. And what we can see is that the plan you know, is on track uh, over this 20-year this horizon uh, towards achieving uh, full funding. Turning to slide 12, this really gets at uh, why that's the case. It's due to the very strong funding policy or the very strong contribution policy. And so we show uh, the dollar value of contributions here in blue, uh, and as well compare that to benefit payments uh, in, in yellow there. Um, we also look in red, uh, which is the net outflows 
as a percent of assets. That's a key liquidity measure for us. And what we see is that um, you know that remains um, you know very moderate uh, over the near term. And it really would only be um, in the very distant future that uh, you know we would we would start to raise more concerns about uh, net outflows um, relative to assets being uh, something we want to be more mindful of when it comes to liquidity. But we think that all the steps that the plan has taken over the recent years uh, to increase the capital preservation allocation and, and improve liquidity, those those have been uh, really uh, great for the plan and, and put them put the plan in a good place today. Returning to slide 13, uh, these are the, the mixes um, that we work with staff to, to create uh, and, and model. In the middle of uh, this table, the current target, that's where we are today. 75% return seeking assets at the top uh, versus 25% capital preservation. And we examine a higher risk asset allocation on the right and a lower risk asset allocation on the left. Uh, and so uh, we'll repeat that in the, the charts there with, with the current target in, in the middle. And so what we're doing there is, is moving um, additional money into the return seeking assets uh, to get to the higher risk allocation or reducing that uh, to get to the lower risk allocation and vice versa with, with capital preservation. <clears throat> and so um, you know, what we've, we've done here importantly is, is keep private equity uh, constrained at 16% and said that there, there wouldn't be a change uh, in asset allocation there, uh, but that uh, the public markets um, as well as the real estate uh, allocation uh, could be subject to change uh, in this scenario where uh, uh, the investment committee uh, were to want to pursue a different asset allocation. And so the bottom of this table really summarizes the impact of that in terms of expected 10-year return. Um, so for the higher risk allocation, going from 7.24% uh, currently to 7.38%, and then for the lower risk allocation down to 7.05%. So uh, you know that would bring uh, the expected return closer to the discount rate in that, that lower risk scenario, um, you know, however, not, not all the way down to the discount rate of 6.875%. Um, and importantly there, you'll see that projected standard deviation number, a statistical measure of risk, uh, does vary with that asset allocation accordingly. And so page 14 tries to help um, visualize this concept um, by looking at uh, not just the expected return, which is uh, the median case or the expected case there in the, the middle of the table or in the middle of the chart, uh, right where the yellow box meets the green box. But it also is looking at, you know, what is a worst case outcome? And we define that as the 97.5th percentile. And so that really means that there is a 1 in 40 chance of a occurrence that is worse than that number. So it's a, a very unlikely uh, outcome that we define as, as our worst case scenario. A couple of other uh, you know, thresholds uh, we want to mention uh, here is uh, a 5.875%. And because this is what we're looking at right now, one year time horizon, you know, what that indicates is that uh, over a one year period in the future, what is the probability that your returns will contribute to the ability of SERS to avoid risk sharing. So it's it's not the actual probability of triggering risk sharing, uh, but it's rather a, a purely forward-looking measure over a one-year horizon. Additionally, we look at uh, the probability of, of a loss, that probability that returns are, are below 0%. Um, and in, in both of those cases, um, the change to the asset allocation does not change those probabilities very much. Uh, there's, there's just a small change uh, based on that taking of higher or lower risk. And then finally, the bottom row here is this probability of, of a large investment loss of minus 20% or worse, and that comes from uh, Corn Ferry's uh, stress testing and, and risk assessment reports that they do annually. And so very small probability of, of that occurring uh, based on any of the asset allocations examined. Uh, turning to page 15, this is now looking out over 10-year horizons. So uh, Callan's uh, full 10-year horizon uh, for our preliminary 2023 capital market assumptions. And now uh, what we're doing is, is also examining in that, that probability row uh, at the bottom of the table, 
what is the probability of exceeding the discount rate? And so you see that there is a greater than 50% chance um, that any of these asset allocations will be able to uh, meet or exceed that, that discount rate over a 10 year horizon. Page 16, now we're getting into the modeling of the assets and the liabilities. So translating uh, Callan's um, simulation of the markets into a simulation of your actual financial position. And so, um, you know, again, what you can see is between the yellow and the, the green box, that is your uh, 50th percentile or expected case, median case. And then the worst case there is below at the bottom of the red box, that 97.5th percentile worst case scenario. Turning uh, to slide 17, uh, this is the accrued liability. You can see that it varies uh, very little. It, it varies a bit with inflation, but it's much more predictable than, than the assets. Turning to page 18, um, you know, this is perhaps uh, the most uh, informative uh, chart here on um, this asset liability study. And what it is is the employer contribution rate, right? So as a percent of payroll, uh, how much could have to be put in uh, to the plan. And so um, you can see in the chart, uh, in the, the middle of the boxes between the yellow and the green, that's the expected case. Uh, or similarly, we put it in the table there and highlight it in blue, the expected case. And so what you see there is that uh, in that expected case, we think that uh, the contribution rate uh, will decline slowly over time. And really that's, that's due to the way that the uh, unfunded liability is being amortized over time. However, we highlight also a worst case scenario, right? So uh, above the red box now, uh, the, the worst case outcome is a higher employer contribution rate. Um, and then as well in the table also kind of highlighted in this, this red color is how bad uh, things could get from uh, the perspective of an employer contribution rate. It could exceed 45% uh, of payroll uh, towards the end of the period shown here. Um, but again, that is a very unlikely and, and worst case outcome for the plan. Slide 19. Now what we're doing is um, accumulating those contributions uh, we looked at before, and we're expressing them now in dollar terms rather than as a percent of payroll in a specific year. And so this is important because what we were looking at before uh, was just single year outcomes. And so we don't think um, it's likely at all that you would, you know, for example, get th those worst case outcomes year after year after year. Uh, but instead, what we do here is look over the full 10-year horizon, how much were all of the, the contributions uh, in different market scenarios, and, ex and see what do we expect uh, and what could be a worst-case outcome, right? So uh, for the current asset allocation, uh, expecting $24.9 billion uh, in that uh, median case, uh, but that, in a worst-case scenario, could rise to $33.8 billion. And what we do here is compare uh, what those uh, different outcomes would be using uh, a lower risk asset allocation on the left or a higher risk asset allocation on the right. And so what you see is that moving, for example, to uh, a lower risk asset allocation on the left uh, would actually increase uh, the expected contributions over that full 10 year horizon to 25 billion. Um, however, if we had a worst case scenario for the capital markets over 10 years, uh, a very severe bear market over 10 years, that would indicate that um, those contributions could only rise to 33.3 billion in that, that worst case. And so you see you know, similar kind of trade-off as you move to the right in the opposite direction. Higher risk uh, could allow you to save on, on contributions over that 10 year time horizon, uh, but exposes you to more downside or more uh, contribution potential um, in that worst case scenario. Turning to, to slide 20, um, you know, I think this really gets at, at the, uh, the difficulty here, right, where if you have that worst case scenario for the capital markets and you are um, pursuing a more aggressive asset allocation, that can result in both a reduced funded status as well as, to, as the higher uh, contributions uh, that we saw on the previous page. 
Uh, and so that really is, is what this downside scenario is, is getting at here in, in red is, is you're going to be um, you know, kind of feeling pain from, from uh, the lower uh, funded status, but it also could be worse from, from the perspective of, of higher contributions. So turning to the next slide um, to kind of wrap up the uh, asset liability modeling and the modeling of contributions. Um, you know, this is kind of a theoretical uh, metric we're going to be talking about, but this is uh, the ultimate net cost. And so what we're trying to do now is put uh, on equal footing both uh, the contributions we were looking at as well as uh, the ending funded status after you reach the end of this 10-year horizon. And so what we look at is the cumulative 10-year contributions, how much you put into the plan, and we add to that the unfunded liability at the end of 10 years. Um, so it's how much you paid plus how much you still owe after 10 years. And so when you look at this chart, um, you know, just be careful with, with the axis here. So uh, on the vertical axis is the expected case, ultimate net cost. And what we've done actually is zoom in very closely so you can see the difference. But if you are really to look at, at those numbers in the axis, you'll see that um, they're actually um, a, a pretty tight uh, range here that changing the asset allocation um, does not, um, you know, from bottom to top, result in much difference at all uh, for ultimate net cost when you're, you're considering that this is spread over a full 10-year period. Um, and similarly, on the, hor the horizontal axis, uh, you can see the, the worst case scenario. Again, we've zoomed in very close, so, you know, even that in that very difficult market environment, uh, there would not be a huge amount of difference um, as a result of a decision to change the, the asset allocation from the current target. And so really, you know, what we want to do here is be, uh, um, you know, down and to the left of this chart, right? Have a lower expected cost um, on the vertical axis and have a lower worst case cost on the horizontal axis further to the left. So, of course, this is this is a trade-off, and, and there's uh, you know no free lunch that we're identifying here from from that change in asset allocation policy, and so it's really coming down to um, you know how much of cost will we have to pay uh, if markets turn out as we expect versus how much uh, will we have to pay in a difficult market environment. And so, uh, slide 22 uh, to finish up on our. Um, Recommendation here, uh, you know, as was already mentioned to you, uh, you know, we do recommend uh, that you consider keeping the the overall risk level of the portfolio the same, maintaining the, the current investment policy, um, and importantly, you know, one of our, our observations here is that you know when we look at the health of the plan over time, it really depends on the strength of the contribution policy, and so you know can't can't overstate that point enough. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, that is how we uh, model uh, the unfunded liability and the contributions over time, and, and we think that that supports the current investment policy that um, staff and, and you all have, have done a lot of work over, over time to create. And so with that, see if there's any questions. Representative Schemmel has a question, I think. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and this time for a non-snarky question, but I, pr I appreciate the uh, the review. Uh, so, on the on the risk reward analysis that you have, how how often does Callan evaluate that? And I would say, as because uh, I know it's frequently, but as you do, do you find that 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 chart moves much, or are we pretty much on the same plane um, that we have been over the last say few years? So the, the full asset liability study, where we will actually uh, project out the liability, um, the contributions, that occurs on a three-year cycle. Uh, but we do look at other um, return and risk metrics more frequently with staff, and that uh, primarily would be the investment return and the, the standard deviation, uh, the investment risk, um, but not building out the, the full liability model except on that that. Um, kind of three-year basis. And Kevin, I think we could go to the page that shows the expectations that we had at the beginning of the year and then the current expectations to Representative Schimmel's question to show oh. the 
the expected return is is higher than it I'll was nine. Yeah, than it was at the beginning of the year. Maybe you could go through that again briefly. Just I think that'll get at your question, Representative Schimmel. Can we can we turn ahead to page nine? Thank you. Yeah, so um, you can see that, uh, I mean, actually, you know, we would typically uh, do our capital market assumptions annually. And so we would see that that change come through over the 10-year horizon um, based on that, that annual refresh. But as Jay was mentioning, the market conditions have changed so much, in particular for the fixed income markets and what's going on with the Federal Reserve that we decided to do that uh, ahead of time to try to get ahead of the curve here. And so we created this preliminary set of uh, 2023 assumptions um, in the middle of this year. And so we would expect going forward that that, that would be revised uh, annually absent, um, you know, kind of these very unusual occurrences in the market as, as we experienced this year. Um, and so you can see that that uh, revisit uh, resulted in a, a pretty big change in the expected return over over ten year horizon in, in Callan's view. Thank you, Kevin. Does, does it answer your question, Representative? Yeah, it does. Yeah, thanks so much. Excellent. Uh, not trying to rush, but any other questions on that? We're, we still have a couple items to get through. Blocking you from lunch. Apologize for that. Okay, thank you, Kellen team, for that. <clears throat> and then uh, moving on, we have another item. This is not uh, a recommendation either, item 5H, uh, fixed income education session. Um, we're running quite a bit behind, but if you could open up that presentation, Katie, and uh, Tom, I'll just preface it with page five, picture says a thousand words. Uh, give Katie a second to get the slide over. The, thank you. At the bottom of the chart, you can see a, a straight fixed line. That's our benchmark, the Ag Index. Uh, and then there's strategies and how they're performing under and over that index over time. And you can see the blue line that the Callan team put in there showing the median manager returns have uh, most of the time been above the benchmark index. Uh, th these are active managers. So Callan's going to give us an education, <clears throat> excuse me, on uh, active fixed income. But as I said, we're running behind on time, and we can, uh, Tom, if you can do a quick job introducing that idea, or if you want to roll this into your education session uh, that you're doing at the full board meeting, Tom, I'll give you that option, however you want to handle that, uh, being our time constraint. But in, in your board box, you'll see there's a memo there with a timeline light out assuming you're in agreement with Callan's recommendation here to look at active fixed income to pick up some additional return on a net of fee basis, because it's very likely we could do that based on this information. Uh, so that memo is there for your uh, reading purposes. And uh, Tom, it's up to you if you want to do a quick overview here uh, or carry it on at the board meeting. I'll make brief comments and then we can stop for questions. So. The, Thank you. Sure. So what we've been in discussion with, with staff, and there's more information in our presentation as well as a staff memo, is today there's now three buckets. There's a core fixed income bucket, an opportunistic bucket, and there's a treasury bucket within fixed income. And it's largely passively run. So passive does have benefits like low Low, very low cost, very low tracking error. What our data shows, what our client experience shows, is that active managers have demonstrated the ability to add value, net of fees, in core and core plus fixed income. There are core fixed income managers that have demonstrated this, and in core plus, even more so. That's where we have the highest conviction in active management. We believe that using active management in fixed income in core and core plus can be complementary to the passive exposure. So we're not saying to replace all the passive exposure. This would be a component of the core fixed income portfolio. And the idea is to add return 
net of fees uh, and, and do it on an attractive risk adjusted basis, so not taking excessive risk to achieve those returns. This is where the scale of SERS is also valuable. So the ability to negotiate uh, reasonable fees for active management and particularly in core where the active management added value can be reduced and or eliminated is if the fees are too high. So what we're recommending with staff is going through a manager search process. We'll evaluate all the candidates. We'll evaluate the fees and come back with recommendations if it's approved by the board. So we can we can go into more detail, answer questions. That's the that's the brief summary. Very much appreciate that. Uh, any questions on that? So we're not making decisions today. We're just talking about bringing ideas to you over the next several board meetings uh, to enhance returns. I think everybody in this room is interested in that. So, okay. Tom, thanks for doing that in a succinct fashion. Very much appreciated. <clears throat> and with that, uh, if we could switch to item 5I. Excuse me. 5 I on board docs. Um, we wanted to give the board a heads up on the uh, RFI process that's going to be kicked off here shortly. We have uh, contracts coming up for uh, expiration for both the real estate consultant and NEPC, which was extended a few meetings ago. Uh, and then the general consultant, who you've heard a lot from today, uh, and we're going to ask uh, Rob Borsky is heading up this initiative for us, and he's going to give you a brief recap of what you're looking at out there in 5I uh, board docs, that uh, memo out there. So, Rob, please take it away. Thanks, Jim. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, so, as we had previously done last April with our private equity consultant, the investment office is planning to bring both the real estate consulting and general consultant contracts to market over the next 18 months uh, as those contracts are set to expire. This is consistent with the PPMR recommendations from June of 2020 that requires the request for information process be used during the hiring of all general and specialty consultants. Uh, our process will include posting a request for information for these services uh, to the SERS website while simultaneously sending out the RFI to a select group of firms that we would like proposals from. Uh, as you can see in it's the attachment 5i, the process for the real estate consultant will begin in mid-March, and the process for the uh, general consultant will begin in mid-May. That will be for the defined benefit plan as well as the 401A and the 457 plans. Uh, both processes are set to conclude about a month before their respective contracts uh, expire, just in case we need time for a transition. Again, as Jim said, this is just more as an FYI to the board, so that's all I have, but happy to take any questions. Okay. Thank um, you, Rob. Oh, wait. Yeah. Mary? Yeah. So something that's very important to me, and based on the experience that I had on being on a couple of search committees, uh, within the last few years is the board involvement. And I'm not quite certain what the plan is here. Um, it's, I'm looking at the schedule. It looks like the staff is going to be reviewing the process, the responses, as opposed to committee members. Yes, well, we, now that the investment, pr previously we had a separate committee when we had a main board and no committees. Now we have committees and we discussed with uh, the chair of the investment committee and uh, assistant chair uh, about do we want to have another committee of the committee and and uh, the, the thought was we, we should be able to do it. So no, uh, this won't be done in uh, uh, silence. It'll it'll be as we're progressing through the, pro, uh, the schedule for next year for, for the board meetings uh, as the outline shows, we'll, we'll bring it up at board meetings for discussion. Does that help? I'm not sure. Okay. To be honest, I'm, I'm really not sure because it is so important that the board be engaged and understand what the um, what companies are coming forward and have an opportunity to review the proposals. And yes. And I'm very familiar with an RFP committee. And so how that would work with the investment committee, I'm just not sure how that. Bill, do you want to weigh in on this, 
how, how that's going to run this this go around right I mean our plan is to provide information to the board to the investment committee to review these various firms that have sent proposals in mm -hmm. um, with the investment committee and interview with the investment committee before um, okay. the investment the invest committee so who's going to be ranking the proposals well this is not an RFP process okay. Mary. Right. it's an RFI so, so no it's not ranking? quite as formal right. okay but it's That's correct but we will be it'll be open communications uh, I think it was per your suggestion the mm -hmm. last one that we went through with the private equity consultant. Yeah, no, that's why I was concerned when I saw this outline. It, it didn't sound like the investment committee would be actively engaged, and I, I just we, want to make certain that that is. We'll address, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll formalize that. We wanted to get this on the table and let you know what was going on. Before you heard about it at the very end, we it was duly noted, so that, that was the very purpose of why we did this okay. announcement here. So, we'll, we'll so get, will we have to be in executive session when we discuss this then? The recommendations? I mean, that's it's just going to be different. Well, that's Joe Marcucci to weigh in yeah. on that one. Without actually seeing what it is we're talking about, I, yeah. I can't really. I totally understand. You know, it's it, more of a rhetorical question it, on my point. It's, it's possible they are so fact, executive session decisions are so fact sensitive yeah. in, in the abstract yeah. that we can't really answer. Okay. But what we want to provide, Mary, is uh, the legwork and the heavy lifting getting this. We now post these on the public website, open it up to any and everybody. Uh, we want to get through all that for you and bring it in summary format and show you who has bid and get the discussion going about who we want to narrow a list down to and who you want to bring in. So you'll be involved in that whole thing as the process okay. evolves. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Treasurer Garrity has her hand up. Um, actually, my question, well, I have a couple questions. My first one was along the same lines of what Mary just discussed. Um, if this is a board consultant, right? So we want to make sure that um, it's a board-driven process and not just a staff-driven process. So Correct. I think I, same, same concerns as, uh, as Mary had. And then I had a question um, on the real estate. Uh, will StepZone be able to bid for the real estate consultant? Because I would think there would be some economies of scale in having simply one alternative investment consultant. Although I'm not, in, I'm, I'm definitely interested in seeing what other vendors have to offer. Yeah, this will be published to our website, and any and everybody who wants to bid on this will be able to. And StepZone did bid on it last time, so I would expect to see him again. Um, okay, and then. Um, Will the RFI, so I want to make sure Callan's not excluded from participating based on reporting practices? Uh, no, that, that will not be a problem. Uh, the okay. I think you're talking about that particular item with the performance verification of the custodian, and Callan has addressed that, and we're going to be updating uh, the committee and the executive session on more of the details around that, but that's a good point. No, they, they will be in uh, good stead to bid competitively with everybody else. Okay, good. So does that mean, um, Jim, that the RFI will be written for the consultant to reconcile investment performance reporting regardless of their internal systems, right, or methodologies? Right. Yes, that's okay. going to be embedded as was discussed with this committee uh, a couple of meetings ago. That was a suggestion, and we definitely are doing that. Any okay, Anything thanks. else, Bill, on that? Good. Thank you for those points, Treasurer. Appreciate it. And Mary. Any others? Okay, good. And with that, uh, we have an informational item on the agenda. Just the asset allocation is there for your uh, convenience. And that uh, concludes the public session portion of this meeting. And uh, we'll move into executive session. And our executive director just gave the good news that we are no longer going to be blocking you from lunch. And we can take a break, get lunch, and then have the executive session concurrent with lunch. Yeah, thanks, Jim. We're going to take a few minutes. Mr. Lindsay, Ms. Soderberg, uh, lunch is in, in the kitchen. You know, help yourselves. We're going to have a working uh, executive session with lunch. Uh, let's see if he makes his announcement now so we can just. Fair enough. Sure. Break. 
Thank you, Joe. Uh, the Sunshine Act allows for an executive session to discuss agency business which, if conducted in public, would violate a lawful privilege or lead to the disclosure of information or confidentiality protected by law. The scheduled executive session is to discuss audit results, benchmarking reports, investment manager fee and expenses, investment manager evaluation updates, um, and because the discussion of these matters would result in the disclosure of information as protected by the Retirement Code, this business is authorized by the Sunshine Act to be conducted in an executive session. Okay, we are uh, back into uh, public session. And uh, that really concludes the uh, the new business that we had. Are there any um, questions, comments, concerns uh, from the committee? Okay, seeing none, hearing none. Um, may I have a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. So moved. Uh, all in favor, aye. 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 Good. We are officially concluded, and um, thank you uh, very much for hanging in. It was a, a, a full meeting, and we appreciate everybody's participation. Um, the uh, next Investment Committee meeting will be on December 5. So the uh, meeting uh, is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>